Hey, welcome to the channel of Birdtalk Austria. My name is Fred Kreusenbrunner. I am from Austria. I am the pilot of a Cessna Lima 19er Oscar 1 Birdtalk. This is my baby. It's a 1953 Birdtalk, an A model that flew for the United States Army. My dad flew the Birdtalk for more than 20 years in the Austrian Army and he collected more than 5,500 hours. Luckily, he was my instructor. Thanks, Dad. I'm also a member and safety director of the International Bird Dog Association. Our mission is to keep the stories of the pilot that flew the bird dog in combat alive. This series here now is called Cessna Oscar 1 Lima 19er Bird Dog Legends over Vietnam. We want to keep your stories alive for the next generation. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Gentlemen, this time I have Ray Carl, Cat Killer 32, an army pilot flying for the Marines in Vietnam, live on this channel. Ray, you wrote an amazing book. I love to read it. Welcome to this channel. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm, I'm Ray Carl, and uh, I'm uh, a former uh, cat killer. Well, I'm all, I'll always be a cat killer. It's like a Marine is always a Marine. I'll always be a cat killer. We're a pretty tight-knit group. We communicate with each other to this very day. Um, it was a special unit. I don't know how much more you need to know about me. I, I, For me, the question is, what connected you with aviation? Why did you go to, to the Army and, and, and get a fixed-wing aviator? Was your dad flying or did yeah. you fly model planes? My, my stepdad had been a, a flight engineer on B-24s B, B in the uh, Second World War and actually been shot down and spent about a year and a half as a POW. He never really wanted to talk about that very much, but he, he, he flew and he owned several different airplanes, but he was my stepdad and I was a punk. And, of course, he wasn't cool in my punk eyes. And, and so I, I did get along with him for a long time. And, and he, he, he had an rocket champ. And a buddy of his was a World War II fighter jock. And he had his buddy take me up in, his, in the rocket champ. Well, right away, uh, rather than kind of, ease me into it you know i'm sitting in the front seat i don't know anything i'm just a kid he decides to do some steep turns did a did a couple stalls and then did a a, a, a two-turn spin and it scared the living be jabbers out of me you know and, and he thought it was funny um there were a lot of other ways that if you wanted to introduce someone to flying you know, there's there, there is a process, and and what he did to me wasn't the process. So <laughs> after that, I became you know eh, I wasn't interested, and and that's sad because you know my stepdad owned owned airplane. He owned a CB. He had, he had uh, a couple of air coupes. He had a couple of Aronka champs. Uh, I could have my pilot's license at age seventeen, you know, and and probably impress some of the some of the girls. <laughs> But it didn't happen. So, um, so anyway, then you, you you fast forward to me in college, and uh, I didn't do very well in college. Uh, Seattle University gave me a couple shots at it, but uh, I didn't do well. And so, the, you know, the, back in the days of the draft, and and I got the letter, go down and take a physical, and that's when I just decided, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and enlist which I did, and I got in, and um, I was told when I took the test that I'd done well enough that I should try for OCS. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know. I was just a little speck in this big army. So I applied for Oscar Candidate School, and the first time I was I was turned down, I went to the interview, and they said, no, nah, I need a little more seasoning. So I was still at Fort, Ruck, uh, Fort Ord, California. I, I was working with some really great NCOs in, a, in what they called committee group, and I was uh, working with them, and and they they helped me along the way. Uh, nice thing about the military, 
if you're a young enlisted guy and you show any interest at all in what in what your job is, the the senior non commissioned officers, the sergeants above you, will 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 help you every step of the way. And that's what happened to me. I reapplied for OCS, infantry OCS, and by then this is the spring of 1965. And Vietnam is starting to cook off a little bit. So I went to Officer Candidate School, Fort Benning. Six months of that. Now, all of a sudden, I'm a second lieutenant. Well, uh, I was reassigned to Fort Benning because they were starting basic training there. And I wound up the officer in charge of a rifle range for basic trainees. In the meantime, uh, I, since I was infantry, I decided I want to go to airborne school. You know, that's that's part of the infantry deal. So I did that, and I met another lieutenant there who was told me he was on his he was going to flight school. I said, "Oh well, how do you do that?" And he said, "Well, I you know you got to go down and you take a fast test, the flight aptitude something or other standardization test." So I did that, and uh, the first lieutenant told me I had a very high score. said, I've been here 18 months. He says, and this is the highest score I've seen. So you're going to flight school. Okay. So I do is pass the physical. That was the hard part. Back then they did the interocular tension by placing a metal device on your eye. That was that was a tough scene. Anyway, I, I get it, I get a letter from infantry branch and they said uh You've been accepted to flight school. We don't have a class date for you yet. If you have any questions, call this number. So, and then it was signed by Ms. So-and-so, a lady. I cannot remember her name, sadly. So I called because, again, I'm just this uncertain young man. And I, and we talked. I was very polite. And, and uh, I, my, my question was, can anybody change their mind? Because by now I decided I want to go to flight school. Oh, I got to back up a little bit. The last part of OCS was uh, uh, an air assault problem. And the first CAV had already left that summer for Vietnam. And so all they had for us candidates as aircraft for our air assault problem was the caribou. So oh, that's pretty cool. So we're in the back of the caribou. I look out the little window and he's circling this little hole in the woods of Fort Benning. I thought, no, he's not going to land here. That's too small. Well, he landed there. And so I was pretty impressed with that. And we, we get off the aircraft and we're taking defensive positions and blah, 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 and all that infantry stuff. And I turned and looked at this caribou and I thought, well, I'm going to watch him taxi back and take off. He didn't taxi back. He just stood on the brakes, poured the coal to it. And I thought, man, he's he's not going to clear those trees down there at the end of this little dirt road he landed on. Well, he did. And I thought, man, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. So that that was the spark that, that had me go in my direction of flight school. So I, uh, this lady, uh, she said, no, no, you're you're going to. I just don't have a class date for you yet. I said, well, well, well can I can I call you every now and then just to see what's going on? And she says, you can call me every week if you want. So so I did. I, for about five weeks running, I'd call her every week once, and I was always very polite. And and I think she figured she must have been a mom, and she figured out I was just this lost second lieutenant at Fort Benning, who was so uncertain of, of what was going to happen. And and were they? And I always ask the same question: Will anybody change their mind? <laughs> She'd say no. Well, I got a phone call about six weeks or so into this thing and uh, it was her and she said i'm i'm making up the list for helicopter school for next month but if you're willing to wait two or three months i can send you to fixed one school which would you like and that's and i asked the same question again i said well if i don't pick helicopters because i really want to fly fixed wing, i want to fly that caribou and uh, and uh, she, and she and she says, I don't think you realize who you're talking to. And I thought, oh, man, what I've said something wrong here. And then she laughed and she said, I'm the one that makes the assignments. To... Back then, there wasn't an aviation branch. It was all infantry, armor, artillery, blah, blah, blah. So 
She says, I'm the one for infantry branch who makes the assignments for infantry branch. And I can see, I have this visual now of her. She's got this pile of, you know, applications for flight school. They're all, they've all met all the minimum requirements. And she gets a, a note says, okay, for next month for helicopters, we're going to have 30 slots for infantry. So she peels 30 off into the helicopter basket over here. And we'll have four for the fixed wing class. So she peels off four and sticks them over. In the, and that's where the, that's where these guys go. Well, I'm the only guy I, I, I've ever talked to who had a choice. You oh. can go to helicopters or you can go to fixed wing. And, um, uh, uh, I guess it's just because I was nice to a lady on the telephone, but she mm. gave me a choice. I wanted to fly the fixed wing. As it turned out, by the time, by the time I went to flight school, the army was having to, to give the caribou to the air force. And the air force guys at the operational level they really didn't want the caribou. I talk about that in the book. They yeah. they didn't want anything to do with it because it was slow, and and they were, they were going to have to land at special forces camps and stuff. And they didn't want anything to do with it. They, they might miss happy hour back at Ponsonut or one of the big Air Force bases. So, um, anyway, that's I wound up uh, going to fix them. And that, that's the story. That's how it happened. And that's also the big difference because I did an interview with uh, Air Force uh, Colonel Jimmy Butler. Mm -hmm. I just uh, put it on public on YouTube today. And in flight school, they went direct into chats, and for him, it was it was insane to get back in the bird dog, flying from four hundred fifty knots uh, back to eighty knots. Yeah. Well, I I I have an opinion about that because this is this is what I saw in talking to our marine aerial observers that. The first lieutenants and the well, the, the captains were the ones who always got the fighters, and and you know, and then where you, your class standing was where you you know at some point now we need cargo pilots, and so the lower in the class standing, those are the guys that go to the the fly transport aircraft, but they wanted the young guys in the fighter community, so there were a lot of majors and actually lieutenant colonels who wound up as facts because, uh, and they, some of them were even taken out of the transports and put in, in as facts. So during 67, 68, when I was there, the, the, the facts that I saw were all majors. They, they weren't any captains. Now I know there were some, because they're you know they spread out all over the place and but they for whatever reason that's kind of, kind of seems like that's how the air force operated and i remember one of my aos telling me that they he did not like flying with the air force facts because he he was a captain and the fact he always wound up having facts he flew with out of uh da Nang, uh, they were all field grade officers, majors and, and a lieutenant colonel. And he said they were always pulling rank on him. He'd have to do what they wanted to do. And it seemed like all they wanted to do was was run jets. They they didn't want to do a lot of visual reconnaissance. They didn't want to run artillery, blah, blah, blah. So there there was a little friction there, uh, at least from talking to this one AO, who, by the way, is still a friend of mine. For us... The Army taught us how to fly the bird dog. That's, that they did. But I can tell you from flight school, I fired two rockets, and the way I was taught to fire them, they, were, they, were, they didn't impact in the same county of where I was aiming at because of the way they taught me to do it. Secondly, I got to fire two, art, two artillery rounds. We didn't have enough artillery that week at Fort Rucker. So you didn't. We really didn't get to adjust artillery either. So those things we we learned. We actually learned from from our aerial, our marine aerial observers. All of our aerial observers had gone to the 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 U.S. Navy aerial observer course, and that was that was a ninety day course. Um, many of them, I will surprise say most of them, 
I actually had time on the ground as a platoon commander or something like that. So they knew exactly what the guy on the ground needed. I mean, as soon as we we fly out there and they had the call signs and frequencies of the different grunt units working on the ground, we we go out to an area southwest of Da Nang and and they call up uh, Kilo four four Juliet or whatever and. And they'd be talking to a radio operator down there. Well, what can we do for you today? Well, can you can you look out here to the east of us a little ways and see what you can see? And that sort of thing. Or if they were already in enemy contact, then we'd show up and we we could adjust artillery, we could we could uh run the fixed wing. And initially the 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 two twentieth was formed at Fort Lewis, uh, Washington. In, 19, in March of 1965, in June of 65, the unit shipped to Vietnam. And initially, uh, they thought they were going to be assigned somewhere around Saigon. Well, they got there, and about that time, a bunch of things fell together. Initially, when the Marines landed on the beach in Icor, Da Nang, in 19, March of 65, their, they felt their mission was called Clear hold, pacify. In other words, you clear an area, you set up whatever's required to hold that area from the enemy coming in and, and you know, infiltrating, and then you pacify the locals and get them to try to be part of our team instead of their team. And uh, General Westmoreland uh, decided, I guess sometime in 66, I'm not sure why, but it, or when, but his concept of operation was search, destroy. And out of that grew the body count, which became the, the yardstick by which we measured success or failure. And right or wrong, I said, the, the, we would assault a hill like uh, Hamburger Hill in the Asha. And stay there for a few days and then leave. Well, the bad guys would come right back, you know. We it was it was strange the way it was up. But anyway, he wanted search and destruct. The Marines only had at that time 12 bird dogs, and they were Charlie models, which is a whole different story. <clears throat> they were the only US military force that had the Charlie model bird dogs. They looked a little different from the outside, their tail was square on them, and they um the cowling. Engine cowling was bigger because they had a supercharged engine on them. Um, according to our AOs, uh, they were pretty finicky, and they and they were constantly having maintenance problems. And I suppose part of it had to do with the fuel that they were. <clears throat> I don't know, but they they had a lot of maintenance problems with those aircraft. Plus, yeah, it was no bird dog. It was the the OE one. It was. Uh, I think they only built twelve pieces of that. And yes, it was the they, we call it the Charlie model. Okay, yeah, and and that's what the Marines had, and 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 all of their pilots were jet pilots that, for one reason or another, had been placed back flying bird dogs, and they tended to fly the bird dog like it was an attack fighter bomber, and it isn't, and it never will be. But they proceeded to get them themselves shot down frequently. And they, the Marines tried to fill the gap with their helicopters, their Hueys, going out and visually. Well, the Huey can only step for an hour and a half, then it's got to go get gas. Well, Bird Dog can stay up for, you know, three and a half, three hours and 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge difference there. So <clears throat> the Army told, or the Marines told uh, Westmoreland, we need more Bird Dogs up here. Well, we'll send you a bird dog unit. And it just coincided with the, the time that uh, ma then Major Curry, later on in the general, he went with the advance party and he got to Saigon and, and he said, well, okay, you guys are going to, you guys are going to Fubai. Okay, off we go. So that's how we became under the op OPCON, under the Operational Control of the Marines. We were an Army bird dog unit, OPCON, the first and third marine division so logistically we got our <clears throat> our administrative stuff done through the army chain of, of command 
but our missions were all dictated by the Marines. And, and I kind of like that because for, as far as I'm concerned, we were a long ways from the army flagpole, so to speak. Um, and I like that. And after Bozarth was shot down, for example, and Laramie, he wasn't burned as bad as he could have been, but he, he, Laramie had, the Marines had one piece Nomex flight suits. And uh, of course the army guys, we were all flying in those um, jungle fatigues. Well, yeah. Because of Bozarts was really his body was badly burned and everything and all of the after the crash. <clears throat> our our marine aerial observers said, Well, we'll get two flight suits for every one of the you cat killer pilots. So all of a sudden, all of us cat killers were wearing one piece Marine Corps Nomex flight suits, way ahead of any of the other army guys. And when the army guys finally got Nomex, it was in two pieces. So it looked a whole lot like fatigues. The shirt was out, you know, like those jungle fatigues. The army just, you know, they, they're bound and determined. So we we could wear the flight suits, the Marine Corps flight suits, flying and to the front and to and from the aircraft and in the company area. And of course, when we were in Dong Ha, we, you know, <clears throat> that's all we had with us. But if we were going to the PX or anything like that, we had to put on the, the army. Uh, uh, Jungle fatigues. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Just to make some general somewhere happy. So we, uh, that's how we flew after Teta 68. We all had the uh, one. And that's why when you look at some pictures of the, of the cat killers like Charlie and Doc, those guys all had the Nomex mm -hmm. flowers. And they're a little different color. They're, they're Marine Corps. So they're a little different shade of green than, than the Army stuff ever was. So, yeah, I got the book here. It's a little bit darker. The 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 ones with no makes are a little bit darker. Yeah. No, that's Doc standing right there with a striped t shirt. Yeah, okay, exactly. Guys, there's a couple <laughs> other guys standing here in the gray cotton army flight suits. I mean, we, we had those and, and you could wear them around the company area, but you could not wear them if you left the company area. But that's Doc standing there. He was he was quite the, well. He still is quite the character, as you well know. He's, uh, have you been Have you been called the cat killers from the beginning on, or have you been called cat killers when you went to the Marines? Okay, here we go. Here's the story. There was a captain, Dick Quigley, who was one of the original cat killers when the unit was formed in Fort Lewis, and the the advance party got to Saigon, and then. The aircraft show, you know, the aircraft starts showing up like in May, and they were assembled, reassembled down there at Pansanud, I think, down by Saigon. And so the first flight of Cat Killer aircraft, 220th aircraft, to go north to Fubai, because Pansanud is down in Three Corps, and they had to fly all the way up past Da Nang to get to Fubai. He's leading a flight of four. And, the, and, and the, the actual story goes like this. Quigley is leading a flight of four. And so he calls Da Nang approach. And he says, uh, Da Nang approach, this is Army 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever his tail number was. Flight of four, request permission to transit south to north through your, you know, through your area. And I talked to Dick about this because how we got the name Cat Killer was was kind of fuzzy, and I wanted to find the real reason. One of the guys told me he thought it was because somebody got drunk at the club and dro drove over a cat on the sidewalk, you know, and killed the cat. So, no, Quigley, you know, they approached, says to Quigley, everybody has a ca call sign. What's your call sign? Well, Quigley says to this day, he really doesn't know why he said it, but he said for some reason, the thought jumped into his head that we're flying bird dogs and dogs kill cats. He said, I, I can't, I cannot say why I thought that that just jumped into my mind. So he said, I, you know, cause we're getting closer to Da Nang and we got to get something going here. So he's, I keyed the mic and I said, well, this is cat killer. One, two, three, four, five, uh, flight of four, blah, blah, blah. And, and the, so the name stuck. 
it's a rather inauspicious beginning to what became a, a, a kind of a legendary unit. You know, the, like the two nineteenth, they were the headhunters, and they were in they were in uh, two core, and they uh, uh, they had sta- all of their pilots when they when they rotated home got about a, it's about a twelve inch statue of a Philippine headhunter. I don't know if you've ever seen those statues that they carve in the Philippines, but he's a native. Filipino, and he's got a, like a loincloth, and he's got a, a spear, and he's, you know, one of the original, the Japanese during World War II were terrified of those people, because uh, they did not like the Japanese at all, the Philippine people, and and uh, anyway, the 219th took up the, the, the moniker of Headhunter. They had a great big life-size statue of a Headhunter at their company headquarters, uh, wherever okay. it was before. Um, initially, when the 220th moved to Fubai, the 4th platoon was de- detached and sent down to augment the four platoons of the 219th because the, the land mass area of 2 Corps is quite a bit larger than I Corps. And so they Somehow or other, I don't don't know the, how that actually happened, but the fourth platoon went down to augment the two nineteenth, and they stayed down there for over a year. And then the the first platoon of the uh, the two twentieth, the Cat Killers, was sent down to uh, Quang Nai, which was in the southern along the coast, uh, uh, on the southern part of I Corps. Mm-hmm. The third platoon was sent to Marble Mountain initially. Mm-hmm. They went to Da Nang, Maine, and it, the number of aircraft flying out of Da Nang, Maine with the 14,000-foot runway, it became so crowded there that they built an airstrip about three miles away, right on the beach, uh, slightly south, and, and of course, a little to the east on the coast, and that became Marble Mountain uh, Air Facility, and that's where mm-hmm. they moved all of the helicopters, and when they did that, they moved our platoon of bird dogs over there too, because the Marines had some bird dogs there. We had some bird dogs there. Um, the 282nd Assault Helicopter Company, which is an Army helicopter company that supported uh, the Arvin, uh, they were located there. And then, of course, all of the the H-34s and the CH-53s and the H-46s of the Marine Corps were all now operating out of Marble Mountain which relieved some of the pressure over there in Da Nang, Maine, where all the, the jets and stuff were. So that's kind of how all that happened. So the, the, the third platoon is at Marble Mountain. The second platoon is located at Way Citadel, which is about, I don't know, five kilometers away from Way Fubai. And it's called, uh, there's Way, H-U-E, and then there's Way Fubai, which is, who by our company headquarters was. <clears throat> so that platoon operated out of there on that dirt strip. All of the pilots uh, lived in the MACV compound, which was across the Perfume River, a little bit to the south of the walled city. And they were in the MACV compound. And the um, the crew chiefs were in a villa in downtown Way. Uh, an interesting aside story to that uh during the siege of Way, when the NVA actually came into the city um, and held it, and they were busy massacring people, and the, the, the Marines there in a pitched battle with them. Well, the platoon sergeant, the young platoon sergeant of for the, the crew chiefs there, he had he had the foresight. He actually had two M60 machine guns. All of their guys had their rifles. They had all kinds of bullets. They had all kinds of sea rations. They had water. They had their um, the radio, um, PRC. I don't know. It was it was the not the small one. It was the larger one. Uh, they didn't have a lot of ba- extra batteries. So every hour during this, during Tet, they would come up and they'd call a company headquarters at Fubai and give them a sit rep and say, "Okay, we're still okay." But the bad guys tried for a week to to overwhelm that platoon of crew chiefs 
and that sergeant held them together. The Marines oh. tried several different times to send a column down the street to, to rescue our, our crew chiefs, and they were always you know, blown away and shot up trying to do it. And they said that when they finally did break through and get there to get our our crew chiefs out of there, they said the the piles of dead NVA soldiers all around that all around that villa that they were living in. They had, they they defended that thing pretty darn. No, every one of the crew chiefs survived. It's quite a quite an interesting story that wow. needs to be told and and. The guys who were who were there, I don't know if they're still around to tell it, but it's it's an interesting story. The the pilots all slept over at the MACV compound, and they were able to get get them out of there eventually. But um, the crew chiefs they were there for several weeks before they were able to to get them out of there. Yeah, <laughs> and then, amazing. So that's the th three of the four platoons, and then in March of 1967. The 4th platoon was brought back up from Tukor, and they were sent up to Dong Ha, which is 10 miles south of the Ben Hai River. The Ben Hai River separates North and South Vietnam. Dong Ha was in, within range of the North Vietnamese artillery located in North Vietnam. So they set up there, and they were there during the summer. They actually flew over North Vietnam uh, trying to find these artillery pieces. Uh, that's a little known fact. The missions, missions were called banjo missions. And uh, they, they successfully flew those missions in North Vietnam in a 100 mile an hour airplane. No, nobody was shot down. Well, what happened was, though, we began to worry about our... Uh, our bird dogs that were left parked outside at the airfield at Dong Ha and within range of North Vietnamese artillery. And they'd, they'd fire like four or five or six rounds at once. Boom. And then <clears throat> that was it. So you couldn't get counter battery fire going. So, you know, and, and we were, those bird dogs are precious. So in uh, August, they decided to move the first, the fourth platoon out of Dong Ha and pull them back to Fubai. And then we started a rotation. <clears throat> so by the time I got there, um, the night tit started January 30th. Uh, I was in the, I was in the little officer's club there, the 282nd down at Marble Mountain. And the bartender just slid my fourth, fourth double scotch and water across the bar at me when all the shooting started. And of course, everybody evacuates the little O club, you know, run outside and I grab my drink and ran outside. Somebody's yelling, get in the bunkers, get in the bunkers. I don't like bunkers. I don't like small cramped places. That's why I didn't go in the Navy and go in submarines. And so I carefully with my fourth double scotch and water, I went up and grabbed all my flight gear, my rifle and went out to the, uh, the, the flight line. And one of the crew chiefs, was getting one of the bird dogs ready to go. And he says, do you want to go fly, sir? And I said, you bet I do. I want to be in the sky. So I'm doing my quick pre-flight with my flashlight. I had my my drink sitting on my seat there. Did my And about that time, the uh, a Marine AO rolls in in, the, uh, in their little, uh, what do they call those things? It, was, it wasn't a real Jeep. It was a knockoff of a Jeep. Anyway, he rolls in that and he says, are you going to go fly? And I said, Yes, I am getting the back seat. So finished the pre-flight and fired it up, and the crew chief armed the rockets and taxied out and took off. And I finished my fourth double scotch and water because we're flying around up there looking for. And it was dark. Um, every now and then you'd see the green tracers going somewhere. Well, that's where the bad guys had a machine gun. And I did fire rockets in the general, but whether I hit anything or not, I don't know. It was dark. There wasn't any fixed wing jets up there. Uh, um, we tried to adjust some artillery on what we thought might have been some bad places. But again, you had to be careful. Uh, so after about two and a half, three hours, I went back. So went back and refueled yeah. and rearmed. Yeah. And it was still dark and we took off. And we flew again, 
because I wasn't going to get in the bunker. And we came back in, and that it was daylight by then. Jimmy Wall had already been up, and he he'd taken a couple bullets through the windscreen. Fortunately, he had his he had his uh, helmet yep, face yep, down, yep. And, yeah. He, but he got some plexiglass things, and my platoon leader by then was a different guy. It was uh, Captain Felton. He came strutting out there, and he says. Uh, Lieutenant, you go get some rest. I'll take your airplane. And I didn't want to be on the ground. And my my observer told me what I did physically. I took a half a step back and I put my hand on my 45. And you can edit this out, and I hope Freddie isn't around. But I said, Captain, you go get your own fucking airplane. This one's mine. And he turned around and walked away. He didn't argue with me. He certainly, you know, he, he was not going to get my airplane. If he wanted an airplane, he go find another one. So we, and I said, my observer says, we got to get out of here. <laughs> he just <laughs> got out of cap. So uh, we took off again. And that's when I was able to run a, a spooky on a mortar position. That was a, amazing. And, uh, and that's what was my encounter with Gogo Niner, uh, uh, an armed army Chinook. I think I put some of those th- those background things in the book that you won't find them anywhere else uh, because of because of that. But that was uh, that was the night Tet started, and by the I came back in from that flight, and I was comp- really tired. So I just parked the airplane and went. And, I, and the next day, surprisingly, uh, I was reassigned to the 4th platoon at Dong Ha. So I think that the captain may have gotten on the phone and said, hey, this, this guy and I aren't getting along. You need to send him somewhere else. So, so then I, I went to Fubai and I flew. Uh, we, the 4th platoon had a nice rotation. We we. Our bunk was in Fubai, and that's where we, that was, that was, we called that home. But say on, on today, I'd fly up to Dong Ha, fly a couple of missions, and then fly back to Fubai, spend the night at Fubai. The next day, I would go up, and I would fly, fly a mission and spend the night at Dong Ha, and then mm-hmm. fly another mission the next day, and then fly back to Fubai. So every third day I, I had off. I just lay around. So it wasn't a bad deal. I mean, it was a nice rotation. I guess they figured that was, you know, there were enough of us to do it to make that rotation. Another interesting thing, a lot of the bird dog companies in Vietnam would displace their pilot, they the pilot and an airplane and a crew chief, and they'd send them out to some, you know, remote strip for uh or maybe special forces or you know once you show up with bird dogs everybody wants one so they would do that they'd send guys out and they 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 spike them out to these different places well major curry as soon as the the 220th wound up at fubai everyone every you know everybody wanted a bird dog and uh and he said no I'm going to use the platoon concept. And so we had a platoon at Quang Nai, one at Marble Mountain, one at Way Citadel, and eventually one that, after Tet started, the second platoon lost all their airplanes, so they started flying out of out of Fubai. The fourth platoon was flying out of there, and they'd already moved the first platoon up. So <clears throat> three of the four platoons were, were already in place at Fubai. But what Major Curry did by using the platoon concept was that he was able, the platoon leader at that platoon was then able to better manage rotation of pilots for different areas, different jobs, different missions, uh, rotate, you know, he could, the maintenance was better controlled. So our, our, we had excellent maintenance uh, the entire six and a half years of that unit. Uh, so can I say that, because you said everyone wanted a bird dog, can I say that all the ground troops felt a little bit safer when a bird dog was around? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. When, when we'd show up, 
typically if it was a if it was a, a marine unit moving around doing a what they call a sweep, they'd be moving to a certain area. <clears throat> typically, what had happened is we, you know we'd fly in the my backseater would say, well, they're, they're down such and such a place. So we'd fly down there and he'd contact them, you know, uh, Cottage Kilo 227. This is uh, Black Coat, Black Coat 3, Roger. And then and there'd be a radio operator down there. And he, you know, this is, you know, and we, but you could tell by their voice, they always, there was a little bit of relief in their voice when we'd show up. It's like, okay, now I got, I got some eyes up here flying around <laughs> over the top of me. And they, you know, they'd have us look here or have us look there. Uh, for example, we showed up. I think it was a cottage kilo was the call sign, and they were out in the in the Anwa Valley, uh, quite a ways west. <clears throat> and they were on a sweep, and we showed up, and they said, uh, "Yeah, would you check out there to the east of us? Uh, you know." couple hundred meters or something uh we've been getting sniped at and we're, we're not really sure where the, the guy is but but he's out there to the east of us somewhere <laughs> so i'll roger that so we kind of turned that way and both my observer and i at the same time caught it out of the corner of our eye it was a big clump of trees and we saw a leg disappear into the trees that that's got to be attached to a person so we told them we told them what what we saw and where we saw it, and all of the all of those marine companies when they move like that they have a sixty millimeter mortar, not an eighty one, because the base plate is very heavy, four deuce is even bigger, you know. But a sixty millimeter you can you can carry more rounds because it's smaller. You can carry the tube, you can carry the base plate, and they they always moved with a sixty millimeter mortar. Which, um, you know, it, it's it's not as powerful as any one, but it's still something. It's their own little traveling artillery, and so they lobbed a couple rounds out there, <clears throat> and these two guys split out of the trees. <clears throat> now we're watching them run along a paddy dike. <laughs> so they they had a couple of the Marines drop their packs and take off, and one of them. One of them nicked one of the guys right there on the paddy dike, and he rolled off the paddy dike. And the other one's just hauling ass. And so we're chasing him. And now I'm no longer at 800 feet. I'm down at 50 feet off the deck, and I'm following this guy. <laughs> he, he run, and I make it. I, I try. I was trying to hit him with my landing gear. Is what I was trying to do. Oh. I I don't know why. And I kept making little passes, and I make a little pass at him, and he. Laid, he flopped down on his belly and I come back around. So this went on for probably 15 minutes. And I'm chasing this guy all over the place down there. And finally he winds up in an old dry rice paddy, standing in the middle of it. And he's got his hands up like this. And as I'm circling him about 50 feet off the ground, I got flaps down. I'm just going around him. And he's he's turning. You know, so he's facing me all the way around in time for a couple of Marines to finally catch up. And when we left, they were starting the interrogation procedure. And I didn't see any reason for us to stick around for that. But I actually had a, a, an NVA or Viet Cong uh, surrender to me. <laughs> yeah, I mentioned that. You, you wrote it in the book, yeah. It's, it's an amazing story. But, but that, when we when we would show up, the two things they you could always tell a little relief in their voice because here's here's my eyes in the sky, and as a matter of fact, our motto was the eyes of I Corps. Believe it or not, somebody before me stuck that on there, but uh, they they appreciated our presence they really did another interesting thing was the pilot always used his cat killer call sign and and, and the way that the call sign went depending on the platoon you're in for example cat killer three two means i was a cat killer pilot i was in the third platoon and i picked the number two i i did I, it was nobody else was using it and i always considered two my lucky number so i was cat killer three <laughs> 
when I got transferred to the fourth platoon, now I'm cat killer four two. So the that first digit indicates what platoon you're in. And then the other is, you know, zero through nine. And there were only eight pilots in each platoon. So you could pick a number. So that that was that's why the call sign is what it is. And we and we kept that call sign as long as we were in that platoon. So if I'm talking to somebody on the ground, I'm using cat killer. And my backseater, like down when I was flying on a, a Marble Mountain, they were uh, benchmark, and then they changed their call signs to black coat, and then they had a number. Uh, I remember when we flew up on uh, the DMZ, the call sign of the of the AOs up there was Southern. So that, but never were we. I, do I recall anybody ever questioning us? as to why two different call signs were coming out of that same airplane. Um, another interesting thing, one of my observers told me, you know, most of those Marines on the ground don't realize that's an Army airplane. They think it's a mm -hmm. Marine air. So they didn't, they didn't care. As soon as they heard us talking to them and saw us flying around, they, they felt better about what was going on. Yeah, there. but... But you had the, the U.S. Army markings on the plane, or? Yeah, but it wasn't that visible, you know. Uh, okay. You know, they, they were, the, the airplane is OD, and the and the, the paint on it is black. Um, okay. No you know, contrast. Yeah. But we did use, you know, we didn't have any SOIs, you know, the, the, the codes and all that where you use you talk mm -hmm. to people in code. We didn't have that. Um, so every now and then you'd be flying and, and you'd get this, somebody whispering, cat killer, cat killer. Well, you knew right away it was a recon team because all they, they whispered on the radio because they were usually surrounded and they'd want to know where they were. They'd look for, they'd ask for a sit rep and you'd, you'd kind of fly over where they are. You didn't circle. They'd get real nervous if you circled them. You'd fly over and you'd see them and then you'd fly off ways. And, and look at your map. I'll tell you right now, a bird dog pilot in Vietnam without his one to 50 thousandths maps was useless. Absolutely useless. When that map was, was attached to you. And we all took the one to 50 thousandths maps and we'd cut them up and tape them together, depending on how big an area we wanted to work. And you'd fold them over. And there were plenty of maps to go around. You could get them real easy and make your own maps when we flew it like out of dong ha i think but Charlie, where did you but where did you put this map on your on your knee board or it was just no, it was just laying in your lap or right here somewhere and the guy in the back's got a map he's he's got his okay. out we pull ours out if we needed it usually the guy in the back was giving us the coordinates because he's he's got his map out but you know the Funny thing, flying around at 800 to 1,000 feet and looking at a 50 thousandths map was almost the same scale. You know, it was real easy to pick out coordinates when you were flying around like that. And and like Charlie told you, a dog haw was, was a TACAN, which is a navigational aid that we didn't have in our Army bird dogs. The Air Force guys had it, but we didn't have it. <clears throat> uh, all we had was an ADF a UHF radio, and an FM radio that had two heads on it. So, and in order to talk, you had to flip a switch back and forth. You could have two different frequencies, but in order to talk on them, you had to flip it back and forth, which is kind of complicated, and I won't go into it, but um, we worked it out. But what we did, Channel 109 at, at Dong Ha, because we, we use a lot of fixed wing up there all the time. What we do is is draw like a line out on like a 300 magnetic. We'd use magnetic north. It'd be, you know, 360. And then when it'd be 10, 010, 020, about every 10 degrees, we'd, we'd draw a line. A radial. Yeah. A radio. And then we'd, I don't know, every couple of miles we we just throw in an arc so that we could say okay i'm i'm off the the 
the 355 at 15. And they knew it was nautical miles. So they knew then where to start looking for us. Mm-hmm. But we, because we didn't have a tack in, we, we had it drawn on our maps so we could, so we, we'd give them a, a, a general area and then they could find us easier. When they showed up, they never had, you know, the Jeffs didn't have any extra fuel. And as soon as they descended below about 20,000 feet, now they're burning the fuel like crazy. So you wanted them to find you quickly. And you're giving them their target brief. <clears throat> and uh, one of our pilots, and as a matter of fact, that, that one picture I have of my bird dog at Dong Ha after I landed without a landing gear on it, uh, <clears throat> I think you can probably find that thing. But uh, if you look carefully at the side of it, right underneath, the the rear side window on the right hand side you can see a, a plate with three i know you're there you go that's it that plate that has positions that was metal straps for three smoke grenades there's only two of them on mine right there the lower the lower two the guy in the back seat could reach out and reach down and pull the pin on a smoke grenade, and then we'd go into a tight turn. One of our pilots, uh, Rick Johnson, was the guy who came up with that idea because if you take a look at our airplane, it's you know it's brown. Uh, yeah, yep. the tops of the elevators are white, the tops of the flaps, the tops of the ailerons are white, but still most of the airplane is brown, and we're small, and these guys are 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 coming into us at 20,000 feet, 25,000 feet, they're up high. And so we're very, very hard to see, especially if there's any kind of clouds, broken clouds or anything, you know, we're, we're very hard to see. So Rick came up with the idea to, to save time for them locating us. They had to find us before, before we could shoot the, the Willie Pete rocket to mark where we wanted them, you know, that whole process. Well, we had yellow smoke grenades in there. And if they if, if we thought they were having a hard time finding us, the observer would reach out and he'd pull a pin on and we'd just go into a real tight turn and we're trailing yellow smoke behind us. And that there's a plate that's been riveted to the side of the airplane and then it's kind of bent out at the back so it deflects the smoke out. So there no harm was done to the you know the the fuselage of the bird dog. With that yellow trailing in that yellow smoke. By the way, there's some other interesting things about this. Um, what, typically, uh, when you, you got out of the airplane, you see my. What shoulder. we see, what oh, we see here is 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 the is the standard normal normal seat that also I have in the bird dog. I did an interview with uh, David and uh, D- David McGowan and mm. uh, Francis Jean Alexander. They both had armored seats. But they yes. flew in in '69, and you yeah. flew in. Well, I was '67, '68. We never had armored seats in our bird. Ah, yeah. Okay. Never. Interesting. It was something that came later. We never had them. Um, mm-hmm. But we go in a tight turn, and then they could spot us real easy. That yellow smoke. Oh, okay, we got you in sight. All right, and then they then they descend on down, and then we'd start our target brief, target elevation, where the good guys were, where the bad guys were. Uh, the run-in heading that we wanted them on, which direction we wanted them to turn after their after they made their drop, uh, they would have told us already what they had for ordnance. Typically, the A fours would show up, and they'd have uh, what they call snake eyes and napalm. Snake eyes were a 250-pound uh, dumb bomb that had fins on it that would pop out. That was perfect for close air support. And those were, let me see here. Uh, the snake eyes were the 250-pound bombs. Uh, Nape was a Delta-7. They had, they had code. I've got it written up here. <clears throat> but they uh, they give us their lineup of ordnance. And for the A4s, it was typically two 500-pound napalm tanks. Six 250 pound high drag snake eyes and pistols, which was 20 millimeter cannons. 
And the way we've set it up, we get them to drop the nape first. They want to get rid of that nape because if they take, if they're sticking rounds, go ahead. Uh, is it possible that you uh, tell the audience what what you wrote me because it's super interesting? Maybe the the, the author said uh, it's not good for the book to have the the communication with the ground, but uh, I think it's super interesting if you could tell us how the communication was between ground and and your bird dog, <laughs> and and not not ground uh, between the bird dog and the a forest. Sorry. Okay. What we do is call the DASC, which is the Direct Air Support Control Center or Center. They were located on the ground, and they were the ones who would parcel out the jets to whoever needed them. And so if I if we're talking to somebody on the ground, and, and typically the guy in the back seat by now, he's talking to the guys on the ground, and And, uh, and, and okay, well, let's get some fixed wing up. We called it fixed wing. Okay, fine. So I call a desk and I'd say, tell them who I was, where I was at, and I need a flight of fixed wing. Okay, Roger that. And so stand by. And then a couple of minutes later, they call you back and they say, we got a flight of, uh, we got a Hellborn flight. One of the call signs that was Hellborn was for the uh, A4s. Uh, Hellborn, Lovebug, and Furbridges were the three that I can remember, but Hellborn mostly. They were, they, I'll tell you, the Marine A4s, those guys were so good. I can't, I can't give them, an, I can't say enough good things about them. They say, okay, you got Hellborn Flight 503 uh, heading your way. He's ETA uh, two zero minutes. Roger that. So now we're working with the guys on the ground, maybe maybe uh, getting some artillery up, shooting some artillery, and then the da then then I'm, I'm already I'm on the DAS frequency, and I can hear Hellborn check in, you know, you know they're breathing their oxygen. Oh, this is Hellborn, final ring, uh, dog hot DAS, uh, you know, with you, and he'd say, okay, Roger, contact. Cat Killer 4-2 on button orange. We had different frequencies, and the way they were listed up on our on our UHF radio was just the color, not the digits, the color. Okay. So flip over to button orange, and I'd hear them check in with each other. Uh, dash two's up. Roger dash two. And then, and then dash one would call me, Cat Killer 4-2. This is Hellborn Flight 503. We have two Delta Sevens, six Snake Eyes, you know, uh, and and uh, pistols. They call them pistols, twenty millimeter. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, we've got three zero minutes of fuel. They'd always tell me how long they could stay. Okay, Roger that. I have a target. It's such and such. It's a, it's a. A recon team of Marines are in a 500-pound bomb crater. They're completely surrounded by NVA soldiers. Uh, we're off. I'm currently off the, the 345 at 15 uh, in a bird dog, Roger. Uh, you know, and then they they'll descend down, and if they think they can't see me, I'll have them pop smoke, and we'll go around in circles. Okay, we Roger, we got you. Okay, here's the target brief. And then I tell you know the Marines. What the enemy? Uh, what kind of weapons? I I I don't think there's any uh, automatic weapons, heavy automatic weapons like machine guns or something. They always, you know, triple A is bad juju. Um, um, we we haven't been receiving any fire, or if we have, you know, they're shooting at us. Uh, where they're at, blah blah blah. And then they're running heading. I like I'd like a 360 run in heading with a right hand pull so that automatically lets them know I'm setting up in a right hand traffic pattern. I will be orbiting over the top of the of the the friendlies at uh, 1000 feet. So you try if you try to orbit over the good guys so that when the jets come in they don't want to hit you and if the good guys are right under you then it's, it's not 
drop stuff on the good guys. So in my in my old old man's memory, that's kind of how it went. And then and we in the meantime, my backseater's talking to the the ground guys, and he's saying, "Excuse me, okay, we got to fly a fixed wing up. Uh, they're going to be dropping Nate. Make sure your guys get their heads down." And I can hear him talking to them, and they'll get come back. By now, they're not whispering. They're saying, all right, that. Well, so we we start the first flight in, and I and I tell you, I drop your. I want you to get rid of your Delta sevens first, and and uh, and then uh, you ready for me? Ready for my smoke? Or, or they might say, okay, go ahead and mark the target. And so I come around and put a Willie Pete. Hopefully, right where I want. That, that's the big thing. Hit my smoke. <laughs> you can, when you can tell a fighter jock, hit my smoke, that means you've done good with your Willie Pete rocket. We didn't have any sighting mechanism on that bird dog. But after, I tell you, this I was probably in country about 10 or 11 months by then. I was pretty darn accurate with those Willie Pete rockets by then. And sure enough, hit my smoke. Runs that dash one's in. That's the part where you 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 set up your your orbiting so that you can see them when they're turning from base to final. You get their you get the glint of their wings as they're turning that base to final, and you watch them roll out, and you want them on the heading you told them. If if it doesn't look right, you don't clear them. You say okay, and you might change their heading a little bit, whatever. Well, this looked good, Roger. You're cleared hot. Those are the magic words. If the forward air controller, or in our case, TACA, tactical air controller airborne, that's the marine lingo. You had to, when it was close air support, direct support for friendlies on the ground, you had to clear them for every drop, every drop, every time. And if they did not hear you say cleared hot, they would not drop. And that was the that was those were the magic words. And if he looked like he was doing it right, you're cleared hot. Roger cleared hot. He would come in, make his drop, pull off, turn. I'm telling you, those A4 guys, I there was a couple of times that I've run them on on close, close targets. And those guys, the reason they had the high drag 250-pound bombs with the fins that pop out on them is so that they could drop lower. They would drop, they'd probably be about 100 feet off the deck, 150 feet when they'd, make, when they'd release that bomb. But those the, the fins would come out and it would slow the descent of the bomb and give them time to get out of there. I mean, so they're not getting hit with, you know, shrapnel off of the explosion. Yeah. And that's that's what we did. We ran that. Uh and then I mentioned in the book that, you know, at one point the guys on the ground are yelling, you know, we're getting, we're taking flak or we're taking shrapnel or something. And so we, I shut down the air show. And then he, he, the guy on the ground comes back and he says, ah, one of my people was standing up taking pictures and he got nicked. And so, okay. <laughs> then you tell the jets, you guys are doing fine. There was just some, you know, and then you, you finish the job and, and they go home. And then, go ahead. This was meant with danger close. So if the oh, yes. if the drop is 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 close to the to your own. Glad you mentioned that. If it if it's really close, then you you know, and and in the case I'm kind of referring to, yes, uh, they were very close, and that's that's where you tell the guys around. Okay, this stuff is going to be danger. This is going to be very very close. Is is it okay? And you know, if they were, if they couldn't, if they didn't feel like they were getting up in a place where they could, you know, avoid getting hit by flying metal or something, uh, they'd say, well, maybe you better drop it a little further out. So that um, mm -hmm. danger close was, had to be agreed on the guys on the ground. They had to say, and in this case, the one I'm kind of referring to, uh, it had to be danger close because the bad guys had they, they called it the NVA had a phrase grab the enemy by the belt. And what that meant was they would get as close as they could to our friendly troops 
Anytime huh. I thought, you know, that we were going to use artillery or jets, because if they got could get close enough, that would force us to shoot further away or, you know, so it was grab the enemy by the belt. And that was, um, that was how they managed that situation. They would get as close to our friendlies as they could. Um, in our, in this particular case, the recon team was down in a, it was a 500 pound or a thousand pound bomb crater. It was a big, big crater. And they were, they were able to hunker down in the middle of it. And, uh, any shrapnel was flying over the top, except for the one guy who stood up and he was taking pictures and got nicked. But uh, we got those nine guys out of there. Uh, uh, I can digress a little bit. The next, go ahead. The, the interesting thing is because uh, I didn't ask this question to anyone before. So you, as a bird dog pilot up there, you were responsible. Uh, you choose the weapons that the A4s, Sky Raiders or whatever, which weapons they used. You gave them the heading, you gave them the marking with the smoke. And, but all the responsibility was in your person. So the, the fighter chats, uh, everyone else, they were just following your rules. Yes. And if, and if there was uh, a hit, a friendly fire, uh, it was just your fault. Yeah. Yes. Oh, really? Wow. Uh, see this, <laughs> At the very beginning, when the when the uh, I have to back up a little bit, the Air Force did not want Army pilots controlling their jets in the close air support role. They had what they call forward air controllers or FAC, and in any other core area, if an Army bird dog pilot was dealing with friendly troops on the ground and he needed close air support, he had to call the resident Air Force FAC and have him come over and run the jets. Really? The Army, the Army bird dog pilots in 2, 3, and 4 Corps could not legally run jets, Air Force jets, and the close air support of friendlies on the ground. Now, they could run... VNAF, Vietnamese Air Force aircraft, oh. in close air support of Vietnamese soldiers on the ground. But the caveat was there had to be a Vietnamese observer in the back seat so he could talk to them. They'd understand if it was all clear. Okay. Um, also, Army bird dog pilots in two, three, and four corps could run predetermined missions they could mark the mark a target but it was never close air support it might be a bunker complex somewhere that they wanted destroyed there weren't any friendlies real close well then the air force would show up with some of their jets and the army bird dog pilot knew what the coordinates were he'd go over and he'd fire a willie pete and say okay you know and then he could kind of be on scene to maybe say okay from from your last drop go three o'clock a hundred meters he could, he could do that, but they were never in the close proximity or close air support means direct air support of friendly troops on the ground. And they, they were never allowed to do that. So when the 220th got to I Corps, the Marines said, we're going to teach these cat killer pilots how to run fixed wing. And the Air Force said, no, no, you can't do that. You know, no, no, it's got to be an Air Force fact. And the Marines said, no, 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 those are our jets, and we're going to teach them how to do it and how to do it right. And if an Air Force jet shows up, they're going to run them too. So just that, And so the Air Force reluctantly agreed to that. And the, our Marine backseaters, I told you, the Army taught us how to fly the airplane. Our backseaters taught us how to do the job. They were the ones who really showed us <laughs> excuse me, how to adjust artillery and how to run naval gunfire. How to run close air support. Ah, that that's why the course of the backseaters took 90 days. Yes. <clears throat> ah, now I'm not okay, now I understand. And those A force that uh, you had, they were from the Air Force or from the Marines? Those are Marines. Marines. Okay. The only, the only Air Force jets that I ever ran were Fox Fours, F fours. And I can tell you Phantoms, uh, yeah. The only flight 
The only flight of fixed wing that I ever sent home with a zero over zero BDA was an Air Force flight, Air Force F Force. BDA okay. means bomb damage assessment. assessment. Mm -hmm. And when you give them when the the when they're off target and they're headed home, you call them and you say, because you go look at whatever they did and you say, BDA follows. And it might be 80 over 50. Well, what that means is 80% of their bombs hit where you wanted them to, and 50% of the target was destroyed. 80 over 50. Oh, okay. So I, if I gave them 100 over 100, that meant 100% of what they dropped landed where it was supposed to, and 100% of that target was destroyed. Okay, so you, you would give them that because when they get back home and they they would they'd all always get debriefed and their debrief would say, okay, what was you know, blah, 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 blah. Where was it? What happened? Who did you talk to? What was your BDA? And then coming back to other command channels, because we call and tell a DASC, you know, Melbourne 503 got a, a, a hundred over a hundred. So they'd mark that down. And then that would go through the the other line of communications, and that's how that's how jet squadrons kept score of how good they were. Yeah. You know? So they and so that BDA meant a lot. It meant and and like I said, the only flight of, that ever sent home was an Air Force flight. They the only reason they hit the ground was because of gravity. It, they. They didn't. They didn't hit. They didn't hit the machine gun positions that I was trying to get them to to blow up. Uh, but that that's another story. So, um, uh, but when when you as a uh, when you uh, as a bird pilot up there, uh, the, the the air force was called forward air controllers, and you wrote it in your book. You were not called forward air controllers. How were you called? They're facts. Forward air controller. Fact. Forward no, that, that, no, that's the air force. But the Marines, you were called differently. It's a T A C A, like it's like my email address, Tactical Air Controller Airborne. Yes, now, sir. The Marines, the Marines had the Marines had guys on the ground who were qualified to do this. They had ground T A, but they were T A Cs, Tactical Air Controllers, and they would they would move around with the guys on the ground. And they could control the jets, and they would tell me that that was a little different deal. I mean, I I, uh, I don't know much about them other than the fact that they were qualified TACAs, and they were typically uh, pilots who were assigned. The Marines would assign them to a battalion group or something, and they'd they'd move around. And uh, the night the night of uh, Wild Night in the Valley, that chapter of uh, when we I got called to go down there with Jim Jim Sanders, um, and almost got mid aired by by that jet. Uh, I never saw it. All I saw was the rotating beacon go over the like this over the top of me, and then an explosion further out there in the in the dark. Uh, that's when I realized somebody else is up here controlling fixed wing. Uh, and that's when Jim and Jim says, "Hey, let's just go home. This isn't working." Okay, that was that was that was a wild night in the valley. But uh, yeah, that because any time the jets showed up, there was always two of them, mm -hmm. and that one almost hit me. That second one was out there somewhere, and he's you know he's I had all my lights off because I didn't want to get shot at. Yeah. He had all of his lights off, except I saw that rotating beacon go over the top of me. Uh, thankfully, he had that on. So that that kind of, that was a uh, wild night in the valley. But if you said uh, during a bomb a bomb run uh, to the A four uh, abort or stop, yeah, go they high and absolutely dry. always followed your rules. Yes, go high and dry. Okay, okay, you go right back up, and then they'd orbit up there. You know, and then you can say go high and dry. Uh, I think some of the I think the guys are getting shrapnel. That's why I think that's what I told them in this particular case. It was a recon team. I think the, mm -hmm. 
I think I think we're dropping too close or something. And then and then the guy on the ground, the recon team leader, called back and says, "Oh, one of my guys was." He says, "Your drops are perfect." One of my guys was standing up taking pictures. You know, and I can imagine. Yep. The the next day, I was down at the line shack waiting to go on my flight, and this young Marine E five Buck Sergeant shows up, and he is absolutely strack. He's Hispanic. His 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 haircut is high and tight. His sleeves on his uh, camouflage jungle fatigues was exactly three inches. I mean, you know, anytime a young Marine enlisted guy is going to go talk to to an officer somewhere, he checks himself out before he goes. I mean, that's that's. Mm-hmm. That's the Marine Corps. That's how they operate, and that's instilled in them. That that young man, he could you could have taken a picture of him, blown it up, and made a poster out of it, you know. And and I said, uh, he said, he walks in the door, and I said, Sarge, uh, how you doing? He says, Fine, sir. And he said, uh, uh, What can I do for you? And he said, I'm I'm looking for Cat Killer Four Two. And I says, Well, that's me. And then he then he kind of got this grin on his face, and he told me what the deal was. He said. I was leading, uh, We I had a nine-man recon team. Eight of them, it was their first recon. It was just, it was, uh, they inserted us in an area so we could go over the procedures and everything. We didn't think that we were going to get attacked like we did. He said, uh, he said, thank goodness, you know, I was able to get you on the radio. We were headed back to Dong Ha. It was at the end of our flight that the sun was getting pretty low to the west, and he and I hear this cat, you know, I think his call sign was Lion Cage, and he and he he told me he says, "Where are you three o'clock?" And he's whispering still, so I went over there and saw him in circle, and then went away. I said, yeah, he says we're completely surrounded. Anyway, the next day he tells me. We were down to about 100 rounds of ammunition apiece, and we were completely surrounded, wow. and we would have not made it through the night. And they were completely surrounded by, these aren't Viet Cong, these are guys in green uniforms, these are NVA soldiers, and they were hardcore. Anybody that says the NVA weren't any good isn't telling you the truth, because those guys were good. And uh, they, <laughs> he said we are down to about 100 rounds apiece. We wouldn't have made it through the night. So I got two flights of fixed wing up. I was also get told to DASC I needed emergency extraction. So they, they sent up a flight of CH-46s. So we ran the two flights of fixed wing. The last, the second flight that dropped, it was dark. It was actually dark. And they, I was using the, the burning brush and stuff to mark the, the targets. And uh, they made their drops. And then, and then the helicopters came in and, it's in the book. We got them out of there. They all yep. lived, and uh, uh, that that was that was a that was a good day. That was you know at the end of the day, it's all about the guys on the ground. Yeah. That's all it is, and and that's why I'm telling. I told you, I never heard of a cat killer pilot or a marine AO saying, "Now we don't want to go." We always went. And mm-hmm. and we always did everything we could because because those are our brothers down there. And quite often uh, we were their salvation. What we could do, we I never had a, a, a counterman when we ordered like a call a desk say I need a flight of fixed wing ASAP. I never had somebody call me back and say, well, we're not going to send you one. You know, they 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 might say oh, there's a little delay. We got a lot of other action going on, but we'll get we'll get you a flight as quick as we can. You know, it was always that at least that. But I never had you know. Sometimes we going through the desk. If a guy on the ground, I got the feeling that if a guy on the ground called, it would have to go up through from the company. It'd have to go up to battalion, and battalion then would have somebody on the horn, and they'd call over to the desk and say, well, we need a flight. So there's a delay. 
and and in two, three, and four core area, if an army guy needed, you know, then it'd have to go up to the the army chain of command of ways and then go over to the air force chain of command. And then, they, you know, so there's always a delay, but yeah. we, we could get, we could, they had two a four sitting on the hot pad at Chulai all the time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we, we, you, sometimes we got jets real quick. Um, or if it was really bad, they, they would divert a flight over for us. Um, mm -hmm. So we got priority um maybe even more so than guys on the ground calling in and requesting fixed wing um if if they could get it to us they would get it to us and uh I so there were know. guys sitting sitting in a force with running engine waiting for orders i don't know if they were the engines were running they were probably just sitting waiting and then they okay but they they'd say we've got a flight on the hot pad they, they said they always had a flight on the hot pad during the daylight hours. So there's, there's guys sitting in an A4. But, you know, chances are they never had to sit there very long. <laughs> we were pretty busy. We were busy up there. We weren't fighting Viet Cong as much as we were fighting North Vietnamese. Uh, so what was the what was the average time when you made a call? 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Probably about 15 minutes. Okay. 20. Oh, that's fast, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it, it didn't take long. We get them quicker sometimes within ten minutes if we were down mm -hmm. near to the, down the end where I flew the first the first six months I flew on a Marble Mountain <clears throat> and I was in the area of the Anwa Valley typically southwest of Dene. After I got transferred to the fourth platoon, then all of our work was up up on the DMZ. So it'd take them you know a couple minutes longer to get from Chulai up up to the DMZ, but. Mm -hmm. We still got them pretty fast, you know. About usually that'd be about twenty minutes before we get. Them. Sometimes up on the DMZ we get diverts out of North Vietnam. <clears throat> uh, I ran one flight of Buds F one hundred fives, and that that story didn't make it into the book, but I'll I'll send it to you. Um, <clears throat> we had Marines in a sweep. They were south of Quang Tree, and and uh, they said, "Hey, we're getting we're getting sniped at. Can you get us something in here?" And where they told us they were getting sniped at, there was a village that was not too wide, and but it was almost well, probably half a kilometer long, <clears throat> right on the side of Highway One. And uh, they said that that's where we're getting snipe, sniper fire from. So I said, and they were they were probably 400 meters away, so they just laid down. I called the desk and they said, well, we got we got a, a flight of diverts. Uh, you can have them if you want them. I said, okay. And the call sign is uh, tied. I thought that was that's an unusual call sign. And this was a flight of F-105s that was had been just sent out on a target in North Vietnam, but probably due to weather, usually weather or something like that. Uh, they, they came back? Okay back and the thing is they either they either had to dump their ordinance in the south china sea or typically they dump it in the Anshaw valley somewhere mm -hmm. and uh, there were fast packs operating out in the, in, in, in the Anshaw valley which we didn't know about at the time but they were uh but they did because they couldn't land with with ordinance hanging under the airplane so all of a sudden <clears throat> i get this call you know that, Go to button yellow or whatever. So we go there and they check in and they're, you know, they're oxygen masks and and uh, dash one was this deep growly voice and dash two had a higher voice like so I had this vision in my mind. Okay, there's a there's a old major is dash one and there's a young lieutenant da dash two <laughs> and uh, they check in and I tell them where I am off of channel one oh nine. And he says, okay. And I remember he said, in part of the conversation, I don't see you. And I told him, he, what he told me he had, he had uh, banded, banded 500 pounders. And I can't remember what those were. They might have been Delta. I don't remember what they were, but uh, they were 500 pound Mark 82s. Mm -hmm. Big bombs. 
Yeah. That's the kind they used in Vietnam. So, uh, and they carried a bunch. And so I knew I wasn't too close to friendlies. Um, cause he's, and, and even though he said he couldn't see me, he saw highway one and I put a Willie Pete in the middle of the village and he saw the Willie Pete. And I said, I'll be on the other side of the highway at 1500 feet. Cause I, I knew he had 500 pound bombs. So I climbed up a little higher. I'll be, I'll be orbiting over there. And I, and my friendlies weren't, it wasn't close air support. They were about 400 meters away. So. Everything was set up that even though I could, I, I didn't see him. And uh, normally, for, and for, for close air support, you had to see them so you could control them. Well, in this case, it, you know, the friendlies are far enough away. He saw the road. I told him I'd be on the other side of the road. He saw the smoke. So I cleared him hot. And they told me, we got enough fuel for one pass. So I told him, ripple pairs as you come through here. So Ripple was, you know, set up on his intervalometer. He wouldn't drop them all at once, but he would set it up so it'd be two, 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 like that. It's rippling. Oh. Mm -hmm. And and I I looked down and this camouflaged, needle nosed, almost no wing dart went by underneath me. That's an F-105 from above. They have real stubby wings. They got a needle nose on them, and they're big. It was big, and it was camouflage. Paint job. He went by, and he rippled pairs, and just, you know, he's gone. And about the time the dust had almost settled from his, here comes Dash 2, and I cleared him on. You know, I said, tag on where Dash 2's last bombs were, and continue right down there. Well, <clears throat> I look, I, I flew after they were, you know, they're off the target. And I go over and I look, I gave them 100 over 100. The village disappeared. It was gone. Oh, okay, gone. well. And um, well. I gave them 100 over 100. And I said, <clears throat> by the way, what are you? Because I, did, I, I didn't know what the hell they were. I, I, I was used to A4s and F4s. This thing went by. I didn't know what it was. And I got one word. Thuds. Dash two well, go by. Thuds. Th T H U D S. Thuds. Yeah. And he <clears throat> and he says, Dash two come up, you know, and they changed frequency. So I gave him a hundred over hundred. And they're gone. Because they, they had enough gas, they were gonna go. I think now they were probably gonna go hook up on a tanker so they'd have enough. <clears throat> I didn't even know where they're from. Now I know they came out of Thailand. <clears throat> so they were headed back home. And the only reason I got them was because they were diverts off a target in North Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, I could use them on a valid target rather than have them dump, dump it in the ocean or dump it in the Anshaw Valley. So I had a legitimate target. <clears throat> so that's how I got them. Otherwise, I never would have you know, had them. So I get back to Dong Ha, and there were two cubby facts, Air Force Covey Fax operating out of Dong Ha. They were working caisson, you know, during the caisson siege. And they were, had the Cessna O2s, the push me, pull you, you know, center line. Yeah, must have. Yeah. And one of the guys was was a real affable major. He was real easy to talk to. The other guy was a curmudgeon. Nobody talked to him. He was <laughs> pear shaped. He had he didn't he'd probably been a C one twenty three pilot, and they made him go fly as a fact. Where he's, his ass is hanging out, getting shot at. <laughs> he didn't like it, so he didn't like anybody. He didn't talk. But I went to this major and I, I said, "Major, I got, I got a question for you. What's a thud?" And he said, "Oh, well, that's an F one hundred five. That's the largest single engine fighter in the free world. Blah blah blah. I can go there and supersonic." Or he told me all this stuff, and I said, "Well," and then I told him my little story, and he's, "Oh man," he says, "That's what those guys do for a living." That was perfect. What you what you wanted them to do? One pass, get rid of all your junk, and go home. You know, it's happy hour. So, <clears throat> he kind of laughed. He thought that was funny. So, so the F one hundred five is bigger than the F four. Yes. Ah, okay. It, I didn't know that. It's huge. It's huge. 
It's okay. you know, it's longer and it's its wings are shorter. It's got mm -hmm. little stubby wings on it. Um, mm -hmm. But lengthwise, I I believe it's longer than ever longer than the F four. Okay. <clears throat> it's a big airplane. Anyway, uh, a little quick story aside about these these two majors. During the siege at Quezon, and I was flying out of Dong Ha during the 77-day siege at Quezon. Well, these two Covey facts were assigned to fly out there, you know, running Air Force jets on all the targets. <clears throat> well, like I said, there's one curmudgeon, and he was kind of pear-shaped and more glasses. Didn't want to talk to him. And uh, he... He comes in one day and he came, he landed straight in, coming in from the west. And we could tell we we're sitting out there and watched him come in. And the 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 front prop is stationary. Uh -oh. He lands and he taxis back, pulls into our little dirt ramp area there, shuts down the, the aft engine and gets out. And one of the tires is partially deflated. There's bullet holes all all over on this airplane and this guy gets out and he doesn't doesn't look like he has a scratch on him and he walks around the airplane looks at, and kicks the tire turns and looks at us like don't ask any questions i don't want to talk about it and stomps off so well we're curious as a, you know, you know <laughs> we go over there and we're we're trying to line up these in, entrance holes and exit holes <laughs> It, there was there was like twenty seven different bullet holes in the fuselage out there, <laughs> and and we we decided that the the only way that he didn't get hit by a bullet was in the middle of all that he had somehow gotten out of the airplane and sat up on top of the wing while they were peppering the cabin. <laughs> really, I we we're looking at trying to line up these holes and thinking there's no way that he that they didn't hit him. But he, he was alive and well when we saw him, but he gave us that look like, I don't want to talk about it, and walked off. <laughs> <laughs> and the other the other major uh, took me up for a ride, he's O2. It was kind of, a kind of cute little airplane, but uh, I know this about the O2. If they, if they lose the aft engine, they could not maintain altitude. Really? Um, okay. Could not maintain altitude, and this is I, I, even I guess if they if they got rid of the rocket, but they had seven. The rocket pods they carried on them carried seven rockets, so it's about yeah. You know, yeah. Even if they dumped that, they still couldn't maintain altitude. I monitored one on guard one day when the CAV was busy. Operation Pegasus. They were going out and relieving the Marines at Quezon. Mm -hmm. uh, an O2 call that came up on guard, and he says, you know, they, they shot out my aft engine, and I'm in a constant rate of descent. The best I can do is about 200 foot a minute rate of descent. And he said, I got a place pick, picked out where I'm going to, you know, and, he and there were two or three Hueys that went in and picked him up, and, you know, they probably yeah. sent gunships and blew up the, the O2. Uh, I didn't hear any more about it. But every now and then on guard, you hear this. Uh, I remember one day, you know, I don't know who it was. We were just two flights on a, a flight of two out of North Vietnam. All of a sudden, on guard, you hear, "Dash one, you're on fire. Get out, get out." No, I'm gonna see if I can go feet wet. Oh, you should get out. The flame is really bad. You know, I, this little conversation going on. And you go, "Oh, turn the volume up. Listen to this." He made it feet wet somewhere out there. I don't know where. <clears throat> uh, I'm busy doing something else, but I'm monitoring it. And he ejects. And then you hear Dash mm -hmm. 2, you know, he's circling. He says, okay, I got a shoot. I got a good shoot. <clears throat> okay, I got a beeper. You know, the, the, they get a, the beeper on their survival radio. Yeah. And uh, the guy made it. Now he's floating in the South China Sea. And the Navy... I don't know, might have, this might have been a couple of Navy jets, I don't know, but the Navy had launched a helicopter to go pick him up. <clears throat> and the Air Force had a Jolly Green Giant sitting at Quang Tree. They launched the Jolly Green. And the next thing you hear on guard is these two helicopter guys arguing with each other over who's going to pick up this guy that's floating in the South China Sea. And, <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> Kirk infested water. He just wanted somebody to pick him up. But these two helicopters, neither one of them will back off. And so finally, Crown. Crown is a call sign of a C-130 that's orbiting up there, and they, they control a lot of stuff. Finally, this is Crown on guard, you know. Crown tells the Jolly Green to go back home. Tell, like, so probably was a Navy a Navy pilot. So the and, and they the call sign of the Navy guy is going to pick him up. But just for just for it only lasted for a couple, of, you know, like a minute and a half. These two guys are arguing over who's going to because see if the Air Force had picked up a Navy pilot. Now there's you know <clears throat> bragging rights. The, the, even in the middle of serious combat, crazy, <laughs> crazy little things happen, and that's those were the things I tried to remember when I when I when I wrote the book. The book isn't all guts and and you you know it's not all bloodshed. There's little weird things in it that that uh, that even in combat there's there's humorous different things, and that's how, mm -hmm. that's how I viewed it all. And that's that's what I wrote. That's why I'm sorry that uh, uh, Captain Wonderful, the Donut Dolly, and the Three Legged Cat didn't go mm. in there. Send it to you. Mm. I know you get a chuckle out of it because it's, please, yeah, please. But that that's okay. There you are, boy. You've got a lot of rockets. <laughs> yeah, really and and, it, and it was it was super interesting because there have actually been two rocket panels. The army had those with the four switches. And the uh, the Air Force had inbound and outbound and four selectors for eight rockets each. Wow. Okay. You know that was a, that was had to have been an army add-on after I I don't know when it was installed, but we had some problems with them, and I I personally had uh, problems with one that when I went out to fly the airplane that day the one of the rocket tubes was written up as in op so i only had three rockets oh. and in the course of the mission i was flying i tried several times to fire one of the remaining three rockets and none of them would fire and in the process you know you, you flip open the cover and then you flip the toggle switch and that arms it but in our in our stick, where the you know that little red trigger is for, for talking or whatever, well, for us that fired the rockets, and we had a uh, one of the one yeah. of the pins that normally you put in the cowling. Uh, there was a pin in there, so you couldn't squeeze it. So the process was you'd reach up and you'd arm a rocket, and then you'd pull a pin out, and and squeeze the trigger when you're ready to shoot and then i always put the pin back in some guys left the pin hanging somewhere but i always put the pin back in and i went through this process three or four times trying to fire a rocket and couldn't fire one and in that process i did get the pin back in but i left one of the switches armed you know the the, the cover was open and and the cover was open. When you close the cover, it makes the toggle switch go forward. So that yeah. one rocket was on. Well, huh, I'm on short final, and, and just as I'm on short final in the Marble Mountain, there's two Marine CH-53s were taking off. And fortunately, they didn't climb very high before they broke traffic. Because when I touched down, you know, you touch down in that three-point pitch attitude. Well, as soon as that grounding wire that's down there by the right main landing gear touch that perforated steel runway that rocket took off and i didn't squeeze the trigger the pin was still in there but th there was a gremlin somewhere in that system and that i watched that rocket go right over the top of that second helicopter and i all i could see you know when they flew the 53s they flew them with the lower ramp up but the door they always flew them with that you know the ramp was in two pieces that overhead thing was open. And all I could see was that big black cavernous opening in the back of that 53. And I thought that rocket was going to go right in there, but it went right over the top of them. And then here's the rest of the story. Just south of the airfield at Marble Mountain was a, a, a 
you know, remember SOG studies and observation, the special mm -hmm. forces guys that did out of country recons. Okay, they had a place that was right there where they had a lot of their operators in their compound down there. Well, that rocket landed in the middle of that compound and went off. And they thought they were getting attacked again because they'd been attacked a couple of months earlier in the summertime. Bad guys had come in across the beach and attacked them. And they thought they were under attack. Uh, of course, they weren't. It was just me. I landed. And I thought, oh, man. And I taxied in and my platoon leader, Captain Stackhouse at the time, met me. And he says, Lieutenant, what in the hell happened? And I said, I don't, I don't know, Captain. I said, uh, the pin was in. I didn't squeeze the trigger. But one of the rockets was was still armed. And he just shook his head and turned around and stomped off. And he went over to battalion. And I never heard another word about it. Except years later, I told one of my buddy's uh, personal friends from officer candidate school who had been in SOG. And he says, man, that was you? He said, we thought we were under attack. If we'd have found you, we'd have burned you alive. <laughs> I guess, nobody. He said nobody was hurt. But it was a white phosphorus rocket that went off. That's well, just, you know, one of the little funny things that happened. But, you know, you think about it, you're in a combat zone. Everybody's got loaded weapons. And it's it's amazing that more accidents don't happen. But, you know, most of the time, guys are pretty careful. Uh, heck, I, when I, my car 15 that I carried, there was always a round in the chamber. I had the switch on safe. But to me... If you if, if you have a magazine in there and you don't have a round in the chamber, there's a, a lot of extra stuff you got to do if, if you ever have to use it. So, uh, and we fired um, 100 uh, tracers uh, out the window so you could see where the bullets were going. I don't think I ever hit anything shooting out the window, but I did shoot out the window a lot. Uh, <laughs> Has the every, every round be a tracer or every fifth? Yeah. How was it? Yeah, and in and the two magazines that I had for that for that, I would I would uh use tracer rounds so I could see where the, the bullets were going. Uh okay. I had a here um, this is something you'll really understand. Uh right behind you where the instrument panel light is there on the right on, on the right right side when you're sitting there. Yeah. My I had a car fifteen. Uh I was the last scat killer that had to turn in his car 15. I, I refused to turn it in as long as I was flying. The other guys turned theirs in. They all gave them M16s, but I liked my little car 15. And I had it hanging. I would have it hanging. The, 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 the strap would be hanging from that light. And or there's a hook. Some of, some of the bird dogs had a little hook you can hang it on. And I had a, a double magazine. Somebody had brazed the ends of them together so that it stuck out, you know, further. And the way I had it hanging there, in order to get out of the aircraft, I would literally bump into that weapon. So I, I operated on the philosophy: if I ever had to crash land, and we there was never any thought of bailing out. The the parachutes had been in those airplanes since 1965. Uh, <laughs> yeah. never repacked or anything. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody knew how, so they just they just lean. You had to lean up against them because you know the the way the seats constructed. You got to have something there to lean back against, or your tailbone is sitting on that cross piece. And and uh, yeah, and it was at the same time it was a kind of bullet protection. I've heard. Well, it was uh, one of the you know for a while. Um, some of the guys, I was one of them. We we took the parachute because the the way the harness and the parachute is, the cape wells were always gouging. We never put them on. We were never going to use them. So you just lean back against them, and the cape wells would gouge you in the back. So it was kind of an irritant. So I I took the parachute out. I got a hold of a, a seat pad for a beaver and stuck it in there. He leaned back against it, and it was just thick enough so you weren't sitting on that cross piece. It was a real cozy. And one of the guys up flying the DMZ took an AK-47 round. It went up through the floor and lodged in that parachute he was leaning against, all that packed nylon. It lodged yeah. in there. And that saved his life. Otherwise, that AK-47 round would have gone into him if he'd had the same pad. But as soon as I heard that story, I took the 
I took that uh, beaver seat pad out and put the parachute back in. I figured, you know, a little, a little extra. Uh, extra. But this but was I, your flight suit that that you actually wore, and this is your car fifteen. Right? We we wore uh, no, well initially when I got there, they had us wearing the the fatigues, the Vietnam fatigues, the uh, that everybody the else wore. The army is yeah. fun like that. They want they want all of their they want everybody to look the same. Well, those are the those are the jungle fatigues and. Initially, that's what we flew with. That's also an army APOC filled flak vest. As time went by, and it's after this picture was taken in the fall of uh, 67, I acquired a Marine Corps uh, flak vest uh, that has the, the, the plates in it. It has the... Uh, um, the armor plates, yeah. Yeah, okay. It had that, and around the bottom of it, it has that canvas thing with the with the holes in it, with the with the the metal, the little brass rings where you could hang. So I so I could get rid of the, the pistol belt that had my forty five on it, and I just hung my forty five on the on the bottom of that flak vest. And uh, also, one of our pilots, uh, Frank Bozarth, was shot down on the twenty second of February. 1968 over Way Citadel. Um, it's quite an interesting story. In Hamill's book, he talks about the two A4s that they were controlling that came in under the the de descending overcast, and they were operating on. They were at about 400 feet above the ground, and this is during when they were trying to run the NVA out of uh, Way Citadel, and it took a month, and they. Let me back up on that. Well, let me finish my first story and I'll tell you about that. The reason I had that car 15 hanging like that, and then I had a, a canvas bag full of magazines for my for my car 15 and for my 45. And that was sitting on the floor right there, you know, right there at the right front corner of my seat. So I would literally trip over it getting out of the airplane. I felt that if if I if I tripped over it, then I would remember to take it with me because who knows what your mind is if you get <laughs> shot out. Okay, so that's why I put that stuff there like that. Now, uh, and I never had to use that, but I, that that was my mental way of doing things. Uh, for, as far as uh, the Bozarth incident, you know, um, the second platoon operated out of way citadel from behind <clears throat> inside of the walled city and i sent you some pictures <clears throat> and that a little dirt strip in there <clears throat> excuse me we're yeah there they are and they you can see um the bird dogs that are still in the revetments have been all hit with sap, satchel charges uh the one on the on the on the left all all, all those bird dogs that are behind the revetments there are all damaged that airplane, the bird dog with the all white wing on top, that's a, a, a VNAF, Vietnamese Air Force bird dog. And I don't think that was damaged. That's just sitting there. He mean, you know, but these all these bird dogs with just the ailerons, the top of the ailerons and the top of the flaps painted white, those are all cat killer bird dogs. And they're all destroyed, every one of them. There were seven bird dogs destroyed on the ground during that. Oh. Well, they the bad guys came in across that west wall, and they were actually they were actually in and around that little airstrip. But it, when Harold landed, the thing is they were they were programmed to go at midnight, and so they let them get away. They let them get in their jeep and drive off the airfield, and they went across the bridge of the Perfume River and went to the MACV compound. And Harold said he was just sitting down on his bunk to take off his boots when all the gunfire started. The two Marines guards showed up at Fubai three days later. They they had they they were smart enough to to realize that they would have been overwhelmed and killed for no good reason at all. So they let the NVA go past them, and then they E and E'd all the way back about I'm about five kilometers. Back to uh, Fubai. It took them three days, but they they survived. Um, anyway, <clears throat> as time went on, 
Uh, and this happened at, at midnight on the 30th of January. So now let's fast forward to the 22nd of February, and the Marines had spent three weeks trying to get the NVA out of that city. And then the NVA had gone in, and they, they had just slaughtered any of the local Vietnamese who were teachers or you know professors or doctors or anybody who had anything at all to do with the U.S. They, they murdered them. They, 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 they killed over 3,000 people, I'd heard. Anyway, uh, the, the, let's go forward a little further. On the 22nd, Bozarth is a brand new pilot in the 220th. He's like he's the second week there. He's assigned to the 2nd platoon. And he relieved one of the other pilots, one of the older guys, Gene Frey, on station. Gene uh, later on became an FBI agent, and there's quite a quite a history of him. <laughs> it goes maybe in, in the, he was undercover for a lot of years, but the ceiling was about overcast and about 600 foot of ceiling. And our our rules said you don't operate with less than a thousand foot of ceiling. But any time there was a call to go, we went. They, they left it up to the pilot's discretion. That, that was the rule. The written rule was. You got to have three miles of visibility and a thousand feet of, of ceiling. But if the call came out with troops in contact, we went. We 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 always went. I can never. I cannot think of any time during the six and a half year history of the two twentieth in Vietnam that the the cat killer pilots and the Marine AOs didn't go. They they always went, and so. Bray is out there, and, he, and he, he gets relieved by Bozarth. And he told Bozarth, if the ceiling gets any lower, you go home. And what had happened to Bozarth, Bozarth was given the tail number of an airplane to take for this mission. He goes out, and he was so new he didn't. There were no ro the, the, there were no rocket tubes on the aircraft. It was written up as the rockets weren't working, and so they had the tubes off. They were working on them or something. But the airplane was good to go, and that was the airplane that they gave him to take. Well, he didn't know if it had been one of us older guys. We just said, "No, you find me another airplane where I can, where I've got rockets at work." But because uh, you know we knew we were going to be running fixed ones, so. Uh, the, uh, Laramie, Bob Laramie was the Marine aerial observer. And he, when he, he got to the airplane, he noticed there's no rocket tubes. So he, he went back and got a canvas bag and filled it up with smoke grenades. And they went up to fly the mission. He figured, well, if he had to mark something, he'd mark it with a smoke grenade, you know, throw it. They, we flew with the back windows open all the time. Uh, we didn't open the front windows because if we did, the wind now is hitting the guy in the back seat and it blows his map away and all that kind of stuff. So they, they had a little air conditioning. We didn't have much up front except those two little vents up there. Um, and, and you used the, the grease pencil to write on the, on the, on window. the right, on the window. Yeah. Oh yeah. We yeah. all had a grease pencil with us and we, you come back and there'd be all kinds of coordinates and call signs and all that <laughs> kind of stuff on it. Oh yeah. We didn't, we didn't use a knee board. Heck it was grease pencil on the window. So, they go out to fly this mission, and the ceiling had forced them down to about 400 feet above the ground. And and there was a flight of A4s that came up, and they found a break in the overcast, and they came in under it and asked if they'd mark the target. And they were along somewhere along the, 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 the west-southwest wall over there. And they flew over the position, and they threw out a... The backseater threw out a smoke grenade to mark the tar target, and they opened up on them with a 12.7 machine gun. And it, and uh, according to Laramie, one of the rounds hit Bozarth in the head, so he was dead instantly. And and it also, you know, it, he opened up on him and it, it hit the engine. The engine dies. So Laramie had the presence of mind. It, usually, when we flew. The back, the back seat, the, the the rudder pedals were rotated forward. They weren't they weren't sticking up, and they had a little stick for the back, but and it was a little strap with a canvas strap with a snap on it, sitting on the side. Well, he got that stick in the hole, 
and he was able to guide the airplane, and they glided across the Perfume River and crashed into the front of a building on the other side. And there was a bunch of Marines saw it happen. They went over, and they, they pulled Laramie out of it. He was burned uh, uh, in, in the process, but they, and they sent him home. But Bozarth, Bozarth was gone instantly. And, and to this day, looking back, I just know that... Uh, you know, you get kind of fatalistic in your view of things sometimes if you spend enough time in aviation. And, uh, you know, any of us older guys, if they told us to take that airplane and we saw it with no rocket tubes on it, we said, no, we're, you give us another airplane. And and, and maintenance there, they'd have done something. And, you know, but, but Bozart wasn't experienced enough to, to know to make that decision and, he, and they gave him an airplane and he's a, a young first lieutenant and he goes okay my airplane let's go and laramie you know he's going well there's no rockets but i'll use smoke grenades so that's that's the, the storyline of what happened there were a lot of you know most accidents or most bad things that happen in aviation is a chain of events and if you yeah. were to break a link in the chain somewhere along the way, that that end result would have been different. You know, you, you obviously are very aware of that, and and, uh, and and you can see how the chain of events went and where the mistakes were made. Um, that flight of A4s was just about bingo fuel. They had enough to make one pass, and they were able to find a hole, and they, they hung their butts way out because they came in you know, at about 400 feet underneath this overcast. By the time they got home, they were all shot up too, but they did get back to Chulai with those air, aircraft. So, again, it was just a, an odd chain of events. But I'll tell you, you know, another thing about the bird dog, you know, and Charlie did, I don't think Charlie mentioned it, but the only av gas that we had in Vietnam was 115, 145. Because all of the other aircraft over there that had reciprocating engines, there was the H-34 helicopters. They had that big old radial engine. Yeah. Uh, carib you know, air caribous, uh, C-123s, all of those reciprocating radial engines and stuff, they all burned 115, 145. A-1s. So for us and our little bird dogs designed for 8087, you, you know, you take off full rich, and when you, as soon as you got leveled out, whatever altitude you're going to be at, usually 800 to 1,000 feet, you start, you pull that mixture control back, and you watch the cylinder head temp go up, you know, and you get it up there just before, you know, and, and then you'd leave it there. Uh, if you had to do any hard maneuvering requiring a lot of added power, you'd shove that mixture back up with the, with the throttle, so you'd have, you know, at, you, know you wouldn't burn up the engine, but but you get a rough, I'll tell you what, if you're up against the Laotian border or you're over the top of somebody that you just shot artillery at or ran fixed wing on, and you get a rough renter, it ain't like being over Kansas in the summertime <laughs> and getting a rough runner in a Cessna 122. There's no place to land. There's no place to go. And, and you just hope you can get, and it only takes one, you know, there's two plugs in every cylinder, but it only takes one to get foul. And and boy, I da, 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 you know, it's tough. I I got a couple rough one. I had I think two that I can remember. Um, one of them was on my way back from Dong Ha to Fubai, and I'm just my you know my flying day is over. I'm going back to Fubai. And all of a sudden, I got a rough runner. So I Camp Evans was just a little ways north of Fubai, and that's where the, the the cab was in there with their helicopters. And they had they had uh, they had bird dogs too. They had about a half a dozen bird dogs, and they were used just about only for adjusting artillery. And their call sign was Woodpecker, which the guys that actually flew it loved to just abbreviate that to pecker this is pecker too too which would always piss off the colonels further <laughs> up but you know the, the pilots would love to do that pilots are pilots i don't care you know so i called I, I their fm frequency i had their fm frequency and i called them and i told them i was about 
three or four miles north, and I had a, I had a rough runner, and I and I'd like to land there. And uh, and the thing, if you come up on a radio frequency or come up on guard and give a mayday, you'd better tell them everything you want to say that very first time. Who you are, where you are, what's going on. Because as soon as you release that mic button, everybody in the world is on that frequency wanting to help you. And you'll never get another word in edgewise for the next 10 minutes. <laughs> So I called, you know, on their FM frequency. Well, not on guard. I called on the FM frequency, and uh, they said, uh, "Yeah, come on." Well, there were other, heli you know, first cab helicopters. they they got that frequency on their radio. All of a sudden, they're all jumping on it. When I when I was on short final to their little short dirt strip and rounding out, I saw in the corner of my eye Huey Cobra go by. I mean, I had all kinds of air cover over me all the way down. They, Helicopter pilots love to be able to 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 save save a fixed wing pilot because that means free beer at the bar at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, you know, one of the one of their little mechanics there, uh, uh, they would use grease pencils too, and they could tell they they'd have the cowling up and run the engine, and they could tell by how fast the grease pencil would melt. Which which spark plug wasn't working, and they take it out, put it in. Whoever was selling those spark plugs to the military was making a fortune, because we went through we ate spark plugs like a four year old eating M and M's. I it's amazing. Uh, they just it, they they didn't like that one fifteen one forty five fuel. Uh, I always ask uh, one of the questions is: Is there something uh, in Vietnam? That shocked you, which was very a very positive moment, which was a very emotional moment. Is there anything you want to talk about? Um, <clears throat> let me start with with a pretty common occurrence that usually happened at after two or three weeks in country. We began. I think everyone went through this. You begin to see that we weren't being allowed to unleash the full might of the U.S. military. Um, and I oh, believe okay. the wars that we that we fought since have, have been much the same way. There's we try we try to establish a set of sideboards, um, <clears throat> rules of engagement, ROE. You've heard this many times, ROE rule of engagement and we it's a self-imposed set of parameters that we set on anything we do because we always want to be the good guys and those are rules that we put on ourselves and invariably the people that we are in conflict with they don't operate by those rules they have if they have any rules at all they're not the same kind of rules that we have And so there, there's no fire zones. There's um, certain things you can't do that, uh, as you have seen in recent wars, felt we felt like we were, you know, fighting a battle with one hand tied behind us in, in a lot of cases. <clears throat> And um, that's, that's kind of the, the downside. The good side, the good thing that happened, Just, I think just a question. Uh, this was 1967, so you already had those feelings in 67, 68? Yeah, about, I got there in July of 1967, and by August, I had these feelings that, you know, we're not being allowed to prosecute this thing. Oh, wow. The okay. extent that we are capable of doing. We're, we're being, you know, Built with their sideboards on what we can do and can't do, um, and that that comes on very early, and maybe not so much for a, a grunt on the ground, but for us, our view was always just a little bit better. You know, the guys on the ground could maybe see a couple hundred yards in any given direction, if that, and that was their world. For us, our world was different. We could see exactly what was going on on the ground, and we could, you know, and and we're talking on the radio. We can we hear different 
inputs to see what's going on. <clears throat> so we had a a broader view, a clearer view of of how this whole thing was being prosecuted and and a lot of us kind of felt like, well, geez, you know, if they just let us go on and invade North Vietnam, we could kick the snot out of these guys and go home. You know, that 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 was always the that you would come up in conversation as we're sitting around having a couple beers in the evening talking about what we'd done today and da 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 da. So that that was kind of the downside. The, to me, the the most positive thing was <clears throat> that we're a bunch of young army pilots. All of us, with the exception of our company commander and stuff, all of us were in our early twenties. Mm. Uh, most of us lieutenants, and eventually got to be captains while we were over there because they accelerated the time and grade. Um, uh, there was no inter-service rivalry. Rivalry. The guy, the Marines in our back seat, uh, we very we communicated perfectly with each other. We listened to them. They were our, they were our mentors. They were our buddies. Um, they they like I said taught us how to do the job. And these these men were so skilled at running fixed wing and adjusting artillery and naval gunfire that that you, you just we were like little sponges we just absorbed that and sometimes we could almost when we're doing the job over you know busy doing something one of us is running the fixed wing the other one's doing you know running artillery well the other guy could jump in and run artillery if the other guys are talking to guy. we could almost finish each other's sentences we became that that close there was absolutely zero inner service rivalry in the cockpit of that airplane. It was mm -hmm. all teamwork. Everything that was said, everything that was done, with maybe one exception when <laughs> Rob Whitlow threatened to shoot me because I was landing at Thunduck and he felt it wasn't a secured airfield, but I had to pee so bad. It was terrible. <laughs> and I told him, I'm either going to pee right here in my pants or I got to land. And I and the whole I. I left the engine running and got out of the airplane and peed right there by the airplane. But he sat there with his M16. He's looking at me. And we still laugh about that today. And, you know, he still maintains that 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 he would have shot me. I, I know. Except that he didn't know how to fly the airplane back to Marble Mountain. And it was about a 25-mile <laughs> walk. <laughs> so he just want to walk. So, yeah. But... Yeah, that was that was funny. But the the good part was the 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 teamwork that evolved very quickly and the fact that our whole world was centered on the guys on the ground. And it it didn't matter. It didn't matter what the weather was, it it just didn't matter. We went. And and I I'll always be proud of that because that the 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 feeling of teamwork and then so initially, we were we were all. When I first got there, there was a platoon down at Quang Nai. There was I was in a platoon at Marble Mountain. There was a platoon at Waif Citadel, uh, and there was the guys at Dong Ha. Well, when Tet started, just before Tet started, they brought the first platoon up from Quang Nai because the Americal Division had moved into the Anwa Valley, the southern part of I Corps, and the twenty first Rack. They actually had about six guys that the that that uh, they moved into Marble Mountain, and they and they uh, and the Quangai, and they started supporting the Marines a little bit because the Marines hadn't completely moved out of the southern part of I Corps, and the Americal was moving in. So they actually had about six of their pilots that were qualified as TACA, but we were the only company who all the pilots were qualified as TACA. So. Uh, no, and and I mentioned that there 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 was six of them on my set of TACA orders. There's six of them down at the bottom from the 21st rack. But as soon as the Marines moved up and then out of Vietnam, then uh, an interesting thing happened. They moved our first platoon up, and then the first and fourth platoon started flying the DMZ. 
And then the second platoon got blown up in Way Citadel, so they moved them over to Fubai, and they flew out of Fubai as we got more new airplanes for them. The fourth, and, and the third platoon, after I left, the third platoon. So for Charlie and Doc and those guys, every night, almost all of the pilots and all of the AOs were right there in that officer's club, or the Cat Killer Officer's Club. And that's where some crazy things happen. You know, and Charlie <laughs> and Doc can tell you about that. I, I wasn't around for all of that stuff. But but we we were without without giving it a second thought, if if somebody said we got troops in contact, we went. And that's that's just what we did. And that looking back, you know, at the time you didn't you didn't even think about it. You just did it. But now, you know, being 82 years old and looking back at what we did as young men in our early 20s, uh, it was pretty special, you know, and, and uh, the yeah. killers were different. We were a little bit different than than any of the other bird dog units. What's the story about this picture? Oh, that was a brand new G model. I mean, it was a brand new G model. It only had a couple hundred hours on it sad uh <clears throat> the operation pegasus from the first army's first cav relieved the marines in in uh, caisson um they towards the end of that siege the nva moved roughly two battalions south across the ben high river into what we called leatherneck square And Leatherneck Square was the area between Dong Ha and the Ben High River. And it was bounded on the northern side by, you know, Kantian, Alpha 3, and Jilin, I think, up there. I can't remember all the names, but it was the area north of Vietnam, of uh, Dong Ha. Well, somehow or other, I think the Arvin Rangers found all of the NVA in Leatherneck Square, and the battle ensued. Well, the, the first of the Ninth Air Cavalry, and those are the those are the Aero Scout guys. They're, they're the, the hunter killer teams. They jumped back, and they were operating out of Dong Ha. So immediately they engaged these NVA soldiers, and I don't think the NVA had any idea what they were up against because they pretty well waxed them. And there was a one day I'm up with a, a an artillery observer and we're flying around we're going to adjust some artillery and and i noticed two h-13 uh helicopters aren't the marines didn't have h-13s it's a little if you remember the tv program uh, mash that little bubble plexiglass canopy uh, yeah of course the bell yeah, seven four. there were two of them and they went flying They went, they went flying from my from my right to my left, kind of ahead of me, and they disappeared from my peripheral vision, and I figured they were just going to keep going. And they were at my altitude. I was up at a thousand feet, and I I don't know what I don't know what their job was or what they were doing. And we were busy watching the guys down on the ground. The guys down on the ground had the loaches, the little Hughes loach, and they were just zinging around with them killing bad guys left and right and we were kind of watching that and and uh, I started a left hand turn and suddenly there was this tremendous impact on the airplane holy crap and I uh, I, I looked to my left I looked uh, you know left wing strut left wing tail turned around looked over my right shoulder right wing strut right landing gear Right wing, right tail, observer in the back seat with his eyes about as big as saucers. And I goosed <laughs> the throttle a couple times and moved the controls, and everything was working just fine. And I looked back to my left, and way in the distance, there was one H-13 and then this plume of, of like white phosphorus raining down out of the sky. And I also oh. noticed about that time that There was no left main landing gear on my aircraft. So whatever happened when that H-13 blew up, it slung something with enough force that when it, and it hit 
my left main landing gear and literally tore it out of the bulkhead. And here's a couple things that enter my mind. That landing gear will take a heck of a punishment. But the the wing strut, that, that bulkhead where those two things intersect, that is the prime bulkhead of, of the aircraft. As a matter of fact, it, right over your left shoulder where your M16 is hanging, that's the, the part of that bulkhead that's sticking up there. That is the primary bulkhead. Right above the wing, uh, above where the, the landing gear is attached, is where the wing strut is attached. And so I'm thinking, ooh, whatever tore that landing gear out of there may have damaged that. And if that left wing strut detaches itself, my left wing is going to fold up. And we will fall from the sky and probably not survive. And so I called Dong Hong, and we checked out. We checked out with the desk, called the tower, and I said, uh, I got an emergency here. I, I'm going to land. I did not want to land on the runway because it was uh, uh, a metal runway that had this gritty surface on it. I knew when I landed, I was going to ground loop, but I was afraid of fire. I'd only been up about 20, 30 minutes. And uh, um, I was afraid of fire. I knew I'd ground loop and I'm and afraid of sparks and stuff. So I told the tower, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to land beside the runway in the dirt. Well, Cause there were, there were aircraft were landing and taking off. It was just really busy that day. So I, I set up an approach. I only put down about 30 degrees of flaps. I didn't, you know, the wing folded up. I didn't want to chop off the head of my guy in the back seat. And I, I shut the engine off on short final. And I did a nice three-point landing, and I'm rumbling along in this dirt. And just about the time the lift starts to go out of the left wing, the right landing gear fell down in an old abandoned foxhole. And as the aircraft went across that hole, then it tore the right landing gear back. So you can see the right landing gear is broken, laying there. And I slid on the belly for, I don't know, 100 feet or so. And it rocked up on the nose and then back down, and there's dust everywhere. And uh, I, this is what I, I wanted to point this out. You can look in the cockpit and you can see my shoulder harnesses. I took the time to hang them on that hook, which is what you normally, you know, again, you, <laughs> yeah. Go, yeah. you go back to the habits you form. And again, that's why I had my rifle and my bag of bullets where I had them because I trip over them when I got out of the airplane. I, Without even thinking, I took my shoulder harnesses and I hung them on that hook. And then, <laughs> and then I, I got out and I slid my seat forward. You have <clears throat> Another reason why we wouldn't bail out is because in order for me to get out, I'd have to slide the seat back and jettison the door, put the window up and jump out. In the meantime, we're descending. And then the backseater would have to find some way to get my seat forward so he could get out. So, you know, we never thought about bailing out. So I uh, slid my seat forward and I re reached in and I said to my backseater, I said, Charlie, that was his call sign. I said, let's get the hell out of here. And I reached out in the, the seat belts. You know how they are in the bird dog. They got that arm on them to release them. Yeah. yeah. I reached down and I flipped that up and he was in the back seat with his eyes shut, gritting his teeth and stomping on the floor. And he was coming out of that back seat as hard as he could, but he was still seat belted in. I told him, get your shoulder harness, seat belt as tight as you can. And, you know, <clears throat> so I released his seat belt and he launched and he hit the back of my seat, the top of the back of my seat and his solar plexus. And all of a sudden he went Ugh, like a bag of potatoes. And I reached in and grabbed him and pulled him out. And there's, Fuel running out of the gas tanks. Oh, okay. Crash, the crash truck came rumbling up, and he put a little foam down there. You can see some residue of the foam right there underneath the tail of the airplane. He shot some foam down there. And then we sat around for a while thinking about, you know, it's down a little more. You can see that little puddle. You can see it. It's water. I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, we sat around and amazed at, how we'd survive. <clears throat> and then after that, a Jeep showed up and uh, some cab guy says, uh, the CO wants to see us. I said, well, okay. So I 
get in a Jeep with him and go over there. And there's a little, he's over on one side of the airfield. It's off of this, we can't see it here. He's in a little GP medium tent. And there's this guy standing out, a warrant officer with a pistol, standing outside the <clears throat> entrance to the tent with his cab hat on. He said, wait here. So he goes in and he says something, he comes back out, he says, the CO will see you now. Said, All right. So I go in and you know, report to the CO. So I Captain Carl reports, stood there. This guy looks at me, he's a little freckle-faced, redheaded guy. He's a major. He looks at me, he says, Captain, what happened out there? Well, then I told him what happened. And I think he was thinking that I had mid-eared one of his helicopters, and I hadn't. His helicopters were not that close to me. And I told him what had happened, and he just sat there looking at me, and then I said, uh, sir, I'm real real sorry you lost, your, lost that flight crew. And he looks at me, and he says, we're the first of the night calf. We expect losses. Now get the hell out of my tent. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm sure glad I'm not in the first game. I have an aside I'm going to show you here with this, with this thing. Hang on a second. I'm going to show you a picture. You see that? You see what it is? Oh, yeah. That's oh, that's a, ni a nice painting. Well, nice okay. drawing. Yeah. That is done with charcoal. Charcoal. I'll tell you what happened. I went out to take that flight, and there's a young Marine sitting on a little folding stool, and he's sketching my bird dog sitting there parked in the revetments. And I struck up a conversation with him, and he says, no, I'm a Marine Corps combat artist. Huh. And I said, I said, well, I'll be back in about two and a half hours. And I said, if you'll, you know, I, I got to leave now, but if you'll sketch my airplane, I'll give you 20 bucks for the, you know, and he's doing it with his charcoal. <clears throat> and he says, okay. So I'm back in 30 minutes laying in a heap over there in the dirt. He came over and sat down with his little stool and he sketched that airplane. Took him maybe three minutes to do it. His name is Richard Yako. Y-A-C-O. He is a known commercial artist. Okay. You can Google his name, Richard Yako, and you will see paintings that he has done. Okay. And I have an original Richard Yako before he ever became a famous artist. That's an original Richard Yako. Did he sign it? Sign it right there. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, that's amazing. It's R. Yako, Dong Hoa, Vietnam, 68. And he, oh, fantastic. He, uh, we kind of had a friendship. We struck up a friendship. I, he, he sketched me later on, and you could tell I was really tired after a long day of flying. Um, but uh, he he's, was an amazing young man. He would he would hop a ride on a helicopter during the siege of Quezon. He'd hop a ride and and fly out to Quezon so he could so he could sketch and do his job. He was just oh. a brave, incredibly brave young man. Um, <clears throat> that you can go if you go to a recruiting center where the Marines are. They have they have books of, of what they call combat art, and they've been doing this at least through since the Korean War, but maybe before that. And they have books of their combat art, and some of Richard Yako's stuff is in it. You can you know he's, they allow him to sign his name and everything. So it was it, that was an interesting aside to this. Uh, uh, but you know, you think about it. If whatever it was that hit my airplane hard enough to tear the landing gear out, if it had hit the engine or the prop or the tail or the cockpit, I would not be sitting here today talking to you. Yeah, definitely. I'm probably one of the luckiest. So I guess that's one of the best things that ever happened to me in my tour. <laughs> I will, I will now put up a bunch of pictures. Maybe we can we can talk uh, just a few sentences to each picture. What do we see here? 
That is the, the village at Thunduck near the, of Thunduck near the Thunduck Special Forces camp. And uh, little kids, and you can see there's some kind of little fish or something down here in this basket. Little kids, they just, uh, they're everywhere. They just, the kids are kids. I, I don't care where you are. This, these, this is, I talked about the Thunduck Special Forces camp. This, these are the two woodcutters. Okay. And they're ripping that log, making lumber. And I, I talked, I got a tour out there one day. The Special Forces captain took me around and I said, boy, that seems like a labor intent. That's a long, you know, that's a hard way to make lumber. And yeah. I said, let me see a story. We acquired a Mer Mercedes Benz diesel engine and we hooked it up to a, a big saw blade and we made a saw so that they could make lumber. And he said, after about a week, the village chief came back to us and he said, uh, Dai Wei, that's Vietnamese for captain, uh, we, we can't use that sawmill anymore. Why? Is there something wrong with it? You know, we'll, we'll fix it for you. No, 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 no. The blade is too thick and it wastes too much wood when we make lumber. Now you have to understand the culture. And this is where special forces guys when they go into an area, they have had training on the culture of the people that they're working with, the native. Okay. And, and this is so important because he said that village chief probably stewed over that for a week to come up with a reason that would save face. Save face is very important in, in the uh, Oriental culture. In other words, you don't want to offend someone, particularly if they've given you a gift, an important, a gift is something important that you give. And uh -huh. so he could come back and say, and say, look, we don't want the saw. These two guys down here would, you know, doing this make, they're important. They have an important job to do. So this is sociology 101. Everybody in that village had a job. If you went back to that picture of the, of the guys working with the saw, there's other guys down there working too. Everybody has a place. Everybody is contributing to the overall good things of, of that village. And okay. so the village chief was concerned that if he just said uh, we really don't want it, we, we these guys over here are doing that job, <clears throat> that that would be an affront. And so he, okay. he was found a way to blame it on the saw blade. Okay, The blade's too thick it wastes too much wood when we make lumber, and then and then and the, and then the the captain told me he says then it was it dawned on me what he was saying what what he really meant. So this is it's the special forces guys. Uh, all the work that they did was just, and they still do that today. The special ops guys they they work real hard in integrating themselves with with whoever they're supporting and whoever they're working with. I got here another some some other pics. Sure, I really like this one. That that's insane. <laughs> okay, couple things. If you look at the seat, I'm leaning against that beaver pad. See it? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Well, shortly after this picture was taken, that pad left, and a in a parachute went back in there. I'm also wearing a uh, an army black vest. Yeah. Uh, the helmet I'm wearing was the one I had in flight school, and it was white in flight school. And I and most of us painted our helmet OD so we wouldn't be as visible. Oh, to, that's new to me. I didn't know that. So you took the helmet you had in flight school to Vietnam? Oh, yeah. Ah, yeah. okay. No, I didn't know that. And on this the, is the on way the right. how, you mounted, how you mounted your rifle. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, the car 15 is hanging from the from that hook. Some of the airplanes had a little hook up there. The other ones, we just hung them from that from that instrument panel light. But that it's hanging there. And there's the picture on the front of the book. If you look at that, you can see the double magazine. Yeah, this one, yeah. It's, it's longer than a regular one. It's two magazines that are braced together, butt end to butt end. So the open end of the bottom magazine is actually laying on my leg there, but I figured since I wasn't out in the dirt with it or anything, it would be okay. I just flip it over and stick it back in. But that, yeah. this picture is kind of interesting because 
the name that's on that airplane, there was this little gal, this little blonde back here that I was madly in love with. And she wrote a letter to me every day that I was in Vietnam. Wow. Every day I sit down and write a letter. Now, um, I had these visions of, you know, going home, asking her to marry me, and blah, 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 blah. So I got home. I spent three days at home with my parents, jumped in my Mustang, drove to Chicago where she lived, asked her to marry me, and she said, no, that wasn't what I had in mind. Um, <laughs> Uh, no. And so I traded in my Mustang, bought a new Corvette and went to Fort Rucker. Now there's the, the guy on top is Louie and the guy down below is Warren and he's refueling. These, these guys are the unsung heroes of, <laughs> of any aviation unit. They, they, you know, they work all night long to keep us flying and, and they, they, they were so unselfish. They were just good kids. And, you know, and and they worked long hours and they worked hard. But, but uh, I never had an engine failure. Nobody I knew had an engine failure over there. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe <laughs> later on somebody did. And that's Warren, Jerry Warren. And he, he, he's getting ready to, to get one of the airplanes ready to go. And he, he's got smoke grenades hanging from his pockets. And he's yeah. got two Willie Pete rockets up on his shoulders. And he's walking over to an airplane. He's going to load up an airplane. <laughs> they were good kids. <laughs> 220th Aviation Company. They, their cat killers is two words. Actually, it's one word. Cat killers. And that's, you can see during monsoon season, it's pretty darn muddy. It's nasty there. But yeah, uh, that was our company area, and uh, it was originally the 220th Aviation Company. Then it became the 220th Reconnaissance Airplane Company. Then later on, it became the 220th Aviation Company Utility Light or something like that. They changed the name here. Uh, while I was there, it was the 220th Rack. But you two, all those, all those mods here, uh, <laughs> those, those, uh, oh. How do you call them? Metal blankets? Or? Perforated steel panels. PSP. Okay. And the runway where you landed on, they were also with those? When I when I first got there, for the first three or four months, the runway was made out of PSP too. But okay. they moved in the 245th Mohawk Company, uh, I think like in September of 67. And that's a heavier airplane, and and they kind of tore up that PSP. They for some reason some of the guys flying them, and later on, years later, I got to fly the Mohawk, and I never flew it the way some of those guys did. But they would it's almost like they would hold the stick forward, put pressure on the nose gear, and you'd see them going down the runway with a wave of PSP in front of the nose gear. Um, oh God. And they they literally destroyed the runway, so they had to come back in, and and they rebuilt the runway out of uh, asphalt. They pulled up all the PSP and made it asphalt. Oh, okay. So, and Foo <laughs> was your bar? Yeah, that was our little Cat Killers Officers Club. Uh, to the left there, where you see that fifty-five gallon drum, that's where the uh, uh, volleyball court we put in and there's I, okay. I wrote about that in the book a little bit yeah the, the stonework one of our aos w had been a stonemason when he was a kid <clears throat> and he did all the stonework yeah it looks that fantastic was our, that was our cat killer club uh out the out the back out behind us was where the the 82nd Med, the hospital was, and it was also there was a mortuary there, and and uh, they during Tet, the they were stacking up Marine Corps bodies so bad they had to put them in coolers back there. Oh God, okay. There, see, see all the letters, all of those letters <laughs> I left hand, Laurel. Laurel, every one of them, I've got them all at once. There's like ten or ten of them in there. So now you're looking so lucky. Oh yeah, 
Yeah. But you know, she she never ended with love, Laurel, or anything. She just she'd sign it Laurel. She never indicated anything other than she was just a good friend, but I was reading something else into that relationship. So <laughs> I don't know. I, I think she missed the boat actually. Oh, trying to do a split S and a D model. D models I are pretty heavy. And uh, this is down by Hoi An. And uh, I had a buddy of mine with me. I was flying him. And I there was a guy in another airplane. And he was going to take some pictures. And so I said, okay, I'm going to do a split S. I want you to take a picture of me when I get upside down. I never got much past right there. And, I, and the, the nose dropped out. And I headed earthward. But if you're trying to do a split S and a D model, uh, you got to know what you're doing. And of course, I didn't know what I was doing. I just, that's a nice kind of a cool picture of the bird dog. But you can tell it's a D model. You can see the prop. Of course, there were yeah. four rocks. You know, so it, the nose the mo nose fell through on me. <laughs> and you see the ailerons and the flaps. That they're white on the upside, yep. but the stable, but the stabilizer and the elevator, they had no markings. Um, in, in most of the airplanes, the elevators were painted white too. And why this one okay. isn't, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe it was a newer, newer something. I don't know. But but I like the picture. It's it's yeah, it's great. <laughs> kind of a cool picture. The genesis of this, I, I I'm going to reiterate. This friend of mine lives down the street is a published author. He is now, back then he published eight books by the Naval Institute Press. And he's, he was never in the military. He's just a researcher. And he's written a, num he's, he's written a number of books about uh, the Navy and <clears throat> Navy ships and all that kind of stuff. And so we're talking, I was telling one of my little stories and he said, you should write that down. I said, I have written it down. He said, let me see it. I showed it to him. He says, do you have any more? I said, yes. I showed them to him. He said, you should write a book. I will be your first line editor. So we took a year writing this thing. Tom, Tom is in the, you know, the acknowledgments. He's the first one listed in there. And uh, the hook was... I was told by the editor, one of the editors at the Naval Institute Press, very early on after I'd submitted the manuscript, he said, we normally don't do memoirs because memoirs don't sell very well. But this is the first book that we have seen talking about Army pilots with Army aircraft flying Marines in the back seat in direct support of Marines on the ground. And of course, the Marine Corps comes under Department of Navy. So that was, I think that was the hook that got them to say, well, let's take another look at this. And so so they did. And and it took a year from the time I submitted the manuscript before it was published. And I think if I remember right, it was published in 2018. So uh, it, it took a couple of years in, in, the, in the mill to get it done. But the funny thing is I, I wrote this, I, I never expected to make any money on it. That wasn't the intent. The intent was to tell the story of an army bird dog company yeah. working with the Marines for the Marines and the fact that we were just a little bit different than all of the other army bird dogs. There was a total of seven army bird dog companies in Vietnam. We were a little different than all of the others because of the things that the Marines wanted us to do. And, and, uh, that to me was a story that that needs to be told so <clears throat> so that other other otherwise it'd be an unknown thing even in in hooper's book he really doesn't talk about the marine you know in support of the marines and 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 having marines in the back seat and marine corps operations all of the all of the interviews in his book have to do with you know uh what they did in North Vietnam and the guys that were doing it, you know, and and th that's well and good. So to me, chronologically, you'd you'd read my book first, so you'd 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 get the history of how the two twentieth came to be and and how they wound up in I Corps doing what they were doing, 
And then you'd read Hooper's book. Sadly, he Jim passed away, but yeah. Uh, and then you'd read that, and you and you dig deeper into into how special the two twentieth was because of, of where some of the guys flew. And out of that, and I'll send you these little things. There's a little deal I wrote up called the Myth Myth Makers. There was a nickname that came came around when, during Charlie and Doc's time. Uh, they started calling the guys that flew up over North Vietnam the Myth Makers because they'd come back to the club at night and they'd talk about these wild, crazy things that they'd done and where they'd done them. And the guys who weren't flying up there would say, oh, that's bullshit, you know. Uh, no, that didn't happen. No, that, that's a myth. So they became the Myth Makers. And all the stories they told were true. <clears throat> they weren't embellishing anything. So, uh, and there were different things that happened. To di For example, you know, who'd believe that a helicopter blew up near me and slung something and tore the left landing gear out and we survived? It hit the landing gear, knocked the landing gear off. We survived. We went back, crash landed it, walked away from it. You know, how does that happen? How many other bird dogs did that yeah. happen? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah. It's just, it's kind of crazy. You know, in, when I came back to Vietnam and I'm, I'm flying D phase, let me give you a little background. The, we were the last class, the red hat class that graduated in June 1967 from flight school. We were the last class that did A phase and B phase at Fort Stewart in the bird dog. And then we got to Fort Rucker and we got in the Baron for 50 hours and flew instruments. And then we got back in the bird dog for D phase. And when we went through, we were the test group. They had written this new syllabus for the guys that were coming behind us. Because when they got to Fort Rucker, they already had 100 hours in the T-41. <clears throat> That's that six-cylinder Cessna 172, you know. Yeah. Uh, and it's got a nose gear. Yeah. <clears throat> so they get 100 hours in that at Fort Stewart. Then they get to Fort Rucker, and they get another 100 hours in the Baron nose gear. Yeah. Now you got to transition them into a tail dragger because most of them, most of them were going to fly the bird dog when they got to Vietnam. So <clears throat> there was a, 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 I think it was four or five weeks phase there, and it was called D phase, Delta phase. And that's where we would transition the guys into the bird dog, the, the, the tail dragger. And we and we go through this basic stuff that they did in A phase and B phase, takeoff and landings, power on landings, power off landings, landing over the barrier, uh, navigating, <clears throat> just basic stuff. And then when they left us, they would go into tactics, which was four weeks. And this is where they'd, they'd hang bundles up underneath the on the shackles, bomb shackles. They'd mm -hmm. hang a bundle up there for delivering, which we never did. Because as I said in the book, it's like somebody had a syllabus from World War II or Korea. And, and they hadn't upgraded it to today when they have Hueys to deliver junk. You know, they still had bird dogs delivering stuff. And 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 they shoot they shot rockets and they supposedly adjusted artillery although I got to adjust two rounds which because they were short bullets <clears throat> so it was it was different like the way they wanted us to fire rockets I said okay you're flying around a thousand feet they wanted us to climb up to three thousand feet that takes five minutes when you think oh. about that in a, in a fluid environment five minutes later you're at three thousand feet. Then they want you to pull on the car beat, retard the power, lower 30 degrees of flaps, get the nose pointed down, and whatever you're going to shoot the rocket at. Well, by then, you're holding forward pressure on the stick to keep the nose going down. So when the rocket left, they go into the relative wind. Think about that. You're, you're forcing the noise, nose down. When the rocket leaves the tube, it's going to go. It's not going to go that way. It's going to go that way. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. So now whatever you're whatever you're looking at and shooting at isn't where the rocket goes. It goes somewhere else. Yeah. <clears throat> but that's how I was taught to fire the rocket. 
And, and that's why I mentioned when I got to Vietnam, I kind of found another way. You pull the car beat on, pull the car on, and the nose just <clears throat> drops, pull the trigger, you go. And, and you don't ever have to overfly the target. The way they taught me to do it, you're over the top of whatever you're shooting at. They might be shooting back. <laughs> yeah. uh, so <clears throat> there were things when I went through tactics that maybe they changed later. I, I Hopefully they did. But my job was to teach these guys how to fly a tail dagger. And for them, after 150 hours of tricycle gear, some of them, it was a real challenge. Yeah, a of course. Challenge. You know, uh, well, you you know what I'm talking about. You, yeah. you, know? <laughs> you know, it's all new to them. You say, okay, if you got a tailwind and you're taxiing, you want to push the stick. For, why why push the stick? For? Because the elevator is now down, and any blowing wind is going to help hold the tail on the ground. You know yeah. that kind. Of, <clears throat> the, I taxied out behind a C-130 at Fubai one day. I had it. I had troops in contact, and I had to go. And I taxied out. And there's a C-130, and he's waiting for his IFR departure. And I'm sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. And finally, I called the tower and says, when's he leaving? And he says, well, you know, he hasn't got his clearance yet. I said, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna taxi back into an inter intersection takeoff. They said, you're cleared. I couldn't turn around. As, the, as soon as I got about 90 degrees with my yeah, airplane yeah. to, the, to the, the thrust coming off that C-130, yeah. the tail come up. Shit. So I... Yeah. Called Fox Mike. I called the crew chief. I had a couple of crew chiefs run out and lay across the tail so I could turn around and get out of that prop blast off of that C-130. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so there's little things about, you know, uh, I had a student one day who was a pretty stout kid. You know, when you're in the back seat, your stick is smaller. It's much smaller. We had the controls, but okay. So I'm giving him a check ride. And when you, at the end of the phase, there's a check ride. And they have to do a power off landing and they have to do a power on landing and they have to navigate from, and they have to do a strip, you know, strip landing and do a recon and land on a sod strip. And then they have to come back in and land over the barriers. <clears throat> These things. Uh, what, what was, what was the power off landing? Did you really cut off the engine or just idle? What you would do at the 180 degree point, the 180 degree point, carb heat, throttle off. And you'd start your glide. Okay. It's different. The FAA teaches it different now. Mm -hmm. And then you turn on the base leg. And on the base leg, you would clear the engine. You'd run with the engine. Well, how long you cleared the engine, you would, based on your judgment of how close you were to the runway, you might clear it just a little bit, or you might clear it a little longer than that on that base leg, just so you could, you know, that's yeah. you using your head. So that you clear the engine, you're allowed to do that once, and then it's back to the throttle completely retarded, and you come in, and your pitch attitude is more like the, you're teaching them to fly pitch attitude. All right, for the power on approach, pitch attitude's different. Okay, and you know that you, you you're so, <clears throat> and you 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 brief this before the flight, and I and I told him you you sometime during your flight. I'm going to have you do a go around. Mm -hmm. I want to see how you go around. And so think about this. If you screw up an approach, don't worry about it. I won't grade you on that approach. I'll grade you on the go around. You know, so just go ahead. It doesn't look right to you. Go around. We'll do it again. And I'll just grade you on your go around. Okay, you got it? So we go out there and we're doing, <clears throat> we come around. I want him to do a Power off landings. He's got the pitch attitude instead of here. He's got it here, which looks pretty good until you get near the approach end of the runway and you realize you're settling. Ooh, you put the power in, mm -hmm. and it's not. I'm not. I'm. I'm the check pilot now. I'm not the IP. It's not me to tell him get your nose lower and you know what you. You know, he comes around. He tries it. Does the same thing again. Now he's. Now he knows he's getting ticked down on the grade. He comes around again, <clears throat> same thing, same pitch attitude. And what you did as an instructor, before you sent your student up for a check ride, you went out and reviewed all of those different approaches. You didn't send them in cold. You went and reviewed yeah. this kid anyway, <clears throat> but he's pretty well built little kid. And we're coming down and all of a sudden, this, and, and, I, and I, I had a spot picked out for his go around. 
I had a spot just a tiny bit lower for my go around. Okay. Cause you know, I can see what's happened. You'd be surprised what you can tell from the back seat. On climb out, there's supposed to be a 2300 RPM. I can say, look at your 2250. Why don't you go ahead and put it up to 20? I, you could, you got so good after all the time we spent flying these things. I could tell you when you were 50, 50 RPM off of what you should be. It was, um, you're already at that. You know what I'm talking about. You can tell. You, you, you're on climb out and you go, this doesn't sound quite right. I'm just going to, you know, you yeah, know, yeah, of course. Yeah, and yeah, you yeah. don't even think about it. You just do it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you after a while, <clears throat> you become one with the machine. <laughs> this kid comes in and all of a sudden it starts to go. And then it got to my go around point. And I tried to get him off of the stick and, and I got the power forward. I slammed that full forward. So I'm not at full power. But he's got that stick, his stick, his longer stick, back in his gut. By now he's got it in his gut. And we hit in a perfect three-point pitch attitude. <clears throat> so hard that it broke the tailwheel spring. Now the tailwheel's back there flapping around on its on its, you know, its little springy uh, thing. It's got tailwheel, yeah. Scraped, scraped paint off of the belly of the aircraft underneath my seat. No, really? <laughs> It spread the gear so far that the ins, you know, the you know the brake puck things that are out yeah. there, scraped them off at a forty-five degree angle. You had no prop strike. You know the yellow part that's painted. That whole yellow part was bent forward. <laughs> and we, of course, we went back into the sky. <laughs> and the only thing I could think to do was. I'm going to go around. And so I, and of course, he's off the controls now, finally. And I got him. I got the control. So I kept it low. I only climbed maybe 200 feet. And I went around the traffic pattern. But as soon as I raised those flaps, the vibrations were just, and the, and the tail wheels back there going. So I came back around and I did a wheel landing. It touched down on the main gear. And then I let it roll off into the sod between the taxiway and the runway before before the tail came down and we came to a halt. You got a pink slip. Uh, oh. Yeah, the yellow part of the props, the whole six inches was bent forward. It was, but you know that little bird dog will take a hell of a beating. That main, that's why I'm saying whatever it was, that exploding helicopter slung. To tear that left landing gear completely out of that airplane. That's been insane. Yeah. Must have been part of the rotor rotor head or something. Yeah. Because we hit that hard and, and yet the landing gear, you know, <laughs> main landing gear did fine. Yeah, and especially <laughs> because I have dismantled and uh, built several bird dogs together because I've got five bird dogs in my hangar. Oh, wow. And, uh, it's only one screw that is just a little bit above the position where the landing gear is. So you were more than lucky. <laughs> yeah, I, a buddy of mine has, uh, he's now passed away, but he, he bought a bird dog and, and re completely rebuilt it. And I asked him, because I, I, I didn't really know, I just had this feeling. I asked him, because he's had his completely apart. And he said, oh, yeah. He said that... The attachment point is just above the other one, and yeah, exactly, lucky. yeah, exactly. You're lucky you didn't. And I, I, I just, I don't know for sure, but I don't know what else is holding that wing there besides the the wing strut. It's like a triangle. Nothing. You just but, have, you just have uh, two screws on top, yeah. and if yeah. the strut is gone, the wing, the wing would flap up. Yeah. So we, you know, we'd have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we both. Neither one of us would have survived. So, oh, so it's funny. We were uh, there was a, a a gathering here a couple three years ago of uh, AOs and 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 bird bird dog pilots, and and I went to it. It was in San Diego, and I bumped into the guy who'd been in my back seat. And I didn't really, I didn't recognize him. Oddly enough, uh, and he uh, there's this guy. And he's standing there, and he's got his wife and his granddaughter with him, and he's the, they have some pictures of my airplane sitting there like that and he's talking about it he says you know i had something just like this happen to me when i was in vietnam blah 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 and so I, I, that was us and 
And then I told him, I said, if we'd have been hit anywhere else in that airplane, we would not be standing here today looking at that picture. Yep. And his wife, her eyes, I thought, oh boy, you know, because, you know, all of a sudden comes the realization that it, it came that close, we were that close. But that's, that's, that's fate. That's how that works. Uh, I will do a final question with you. Uh, I, I ask all the guys uh, the same question. How was your uh, homecoming? I'm glad you asked that because uh, it's interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, <clears throat> it was easy. I mean, I came home. I spent three days with the folks. I, I landed as the book ends. I landed at, at McCord Air Force Base and smelled the evergreens. There was no protesters, nothing. I got on an airplane and, and, and a commuter and flew over to Port Angeles and I was home. Then I got in my Mustang, of course, and I drove to Chicago. And after the, you know, the disappointing news from Laurel, well, I got in my Corvette and I drove to Fort Rucker. And, uh, and then I had another two years hanging out in an Army Aviation Center with fellow pilots going to the club, drinking, you know, partying, uh, telling war stories, laughing and joking, being crazy, going to Panama City Beach, getting sunburned. I, it, it, there was no problem. Sounds um, like a good story, yeah? It was. You know, it was easy. And I, I volunteer at the Disabled American Veterans Chapter near, near where I live, the DAV. And typically... One one day a week, I go down there and help guys who have, you know, Agent Orange and and stuff now from oh, the, oh, the Middle okay. East, and, and trying to help them get compensation benefits for for the ailments they have that are that are service connected. And a lot of guys, you know, they're not aware of what's available to them, or or you know, they. The military doesn't do a very good job of telling you that when you when you get out, they just say, "Adios, bye." And uh, we're busy trying to help them get what they deserve. So I'm seeing the the dark side of being a soldier or being in the military. I get to see that, um, but me personally, <clears throat> coming home. I, I was I was back home. I was at Fort Rucker, man. I was a captain. I was making good money. I had a new Corvette. I was going out to the Lake Lodge every Friday night and dancing and drinking and chasing women. Uh, on Tuesday night, we had hog call at the high rise where the local girls had come. That's why they called it hog call. Uh, pretty brutal. Uh, you know, to me, it was just a big party. And then after you know, in six and a half years after I joined the army, I got out, and I I stayed in the I got in the National Guard in Georgia. I finally got to fly Mohawks. Um, I was a Mohawk IP uh, for several years, and then I got a job flying for the Forest Service. But I stayed in the wherever the Forest Service sent me. I stayed in a guard unit or a reserve unit. Uh, I when I got that, I got transferred to California, so I I had to learn how to fly Hueys. Uh, you know, finally, after twelve years as an Army aviator, they got me into helicopters. So you know, my my aviation career started in fixed wing, and then eventually wound up in in helicopters. And so here's my take on it: if you want to get somewhere, fly a fixed wing. If you want to go somewhere and enjoy the ride, take a helicopter because there's, you know, <laughs> you can fly lower, you can circle stuff, you can look at things, you can hover and look, or you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a different animal. And and oddly enough, most of the guys in the army back in the day, if they started in helicopters, they'd literally kill each other to get to fly fixed wing, but. <laughs> Uh, compared to helicopters, but I, you know, I've got probably a 904 combat hours 
in Vietnam, I had, I probably got a couple thousand, I probably seven or 800 hours as a bird dog IP in the back seat. Plus flight school and 150 hours in the bird dog in flight school. So I'm probably getting close to, you know, a couple thousand hours in the bird dog. And Okay, sir. Hey, is there anything else you want to tell? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'd like to sit back with you on a porch somewhere, you and your That father, would be cool. and a, and a couple of nice cold beers and just sit and chat. That's what I'd like to do, really. Um, Yeah, absolutely. because I, you know, your father is kind of at the beginning, and I was in the middle, and you're kind of you you and your son are now at the end of this continuum of of of, of a, the bird dog and what a what a special little airplane it was and and it but all it all began with with you know the the army. saying hey we we need something different and actually at the 1400 pounds the arm part of the specs the army put in there was it had to be no more than 1200 pounds empty weight and it's 1400 pounds and so even though they came in overweight the fact that it's got that six cylinder engine in it you, you know you, you don't have to worry about it and and uh What a neat little airplane. Uh, wow. And and there's, there's been a lot of, you know, I, I was never a hero, but man, I flew with some heroes. Man, I tell you, I, uh, but there, there was quite a mix of unique individuals who were cat killers. And you, you've met a couple of them. You've met, met Doc. You, you know, you've met Charlie. There's some very, very interesting guys. And I, I would not, I will end with this. I honestly would not trade that year for a million dollars. And I mean it. I would not trade that year for a million bucks because I feel like the, the Marine Corps ethos of Semper Fi, always faithful. And we, we assimilated that because we were working with the Marines for the Marines. So for a year of our lives, basically we became Marines. And and that was our attitude, and that's how we operated. And and to me, that's I've I've never encountered that since, and it it was it just very very special in my memory. And um, I wouldn't trade that for anything. It was I, I wouldn't want to go back and do it, not at my age, but um, but then again, maybe I would. Because God, I love that airplane. <laughs> but I want to thank you for. for agreeing to have a chat with me and I hope that we can uh, hope we can remain in contact in the future. Yeah, I would love to, really. And if you ever come to, to, to Europe, come to Austria and be my guest and be my backseat. I will come in the summertime. Yeah, when it's, definitely. when it's good flying with us. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be hey, perfect. thank you really so much for having time and for doing this because it means a lot to me. I do it for also for my son. Your history has to be told. Yes. And as, as I mentioned before, Maybe in 10 years, my son looks this video and thinks, oh, daddy spoke with all those cool guys. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That is really Yeah. awesome. I'm 82. All of us are getting towards the end of our journey. And uh, but it, it's it, gosh, it's been a great ride. It's been a heck of a ride. It's, Yeah. you know, all the things that some of the guys went into the airlines. Uh, I'm glad I didn't. I flew for the Army. And then I flew 12 years for the Forest Service on forest fires. I was the lead plane pilot. You get in front of the air tankers. I was in a smaller airplane, and you lead them down through the smoke, tell them where to drop. That was that was my job. Exciting. It, it was exciting. Adrenaline. Yeah. And then I got. I decided I was going to change agencies, and I changed agencies to customs, and I flew drug interdiction for 12 years. And that was took me to South America and Central America and Mexico. Uh, that wasn't as gratifying work as uh, flying on forest fires. Then I retired from the government and I went to work flying a helicopter for a local TV station for about three years. 
And then that contract ran out. So I went back to flying as a contract helicopter pilot on forest fires. And uh, that was not that good. Some of it was good and some of it wasn't so good. But uh, And then in, in 2004, I flew my last flight. I tied it down and, and filled out the logbook and walked away. That's it. And since then, I, I got memories. Which, and I get to meet and encounter and experience with, with someone like you. That, 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 that's huge. Great. Thank you so much, Fred. I really appreciate it. All right, buddy. Thank you, Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Gentlemen, this was Ray Carl. What a nice guy. Oh, my God. We did a four and a half hours interview. I wanted to cut it and edit it together to one and a half hours. But hey, uh, this is his story and it has to be told. And I really enjoyed every minute of this interview. So I kept those uh, four and a half hours. I edited it to three hours and maybe you watched it in two parts. But I think it's worth watching. And please give me a thumbs up. And I would really appreciate uh, to read some comments below. Thanks for watching.